welcome to Breeders Syndicate, where we explore the history of a clandestine scene through the eyes of the folks who lived it. I'm Matthew, owner of Riot Seeds. I'll occasionally be joined by my co-host Notso Dog, breeder and grower from Mendocino. Welcome to the underground. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Breeder Syndicate, um, where we cover strain history. My guest today is the Rev from Kingdom Organic Seeds. Welcome, brother. Nice to see hey. you. Thanks, man. Good to be here. A long time we haven't talked, so we're going to catch up a lot on uh, everything you've been doing, everything that you've done for the people who are new to you, and where we're going from there. So let's start off, dude. Like, what started the the Rev on his cannabis adventure? Well. I guess I was about, this would have been about 1975, I guess, you know. I planted my first weed ever, and my mom ended up killing it, right? Oh, she, right, as they my do. My ratted me out, you know. So, <laughs> so I was so pissed that my beautiful plants got killed. I had about a half a pound baggie, about a quarter full of seeds. Yeah. So I went out in the backyard the next day, and I just spread them everywhere, right? <laughs> so, so a dichondra lawn of cannabis came up. I my bet. My parents freaked out, and we eventually struck a deal where I could grow four plants. Oh, wow. They they gave in. Yeah, well, I just overrode them, you know? Yeah, dude. And uh, so I was jazzed about that. <laughs> so I grew up in my mom's backyard for a couple of years after that. Just, you know, I was an idiot. I didn't know what I was doing, but I yeah. grew some giant freaking plants, you know? I bet. And uh, then, you know, my dad, he was a, a hydroponic experiment scientist guy. He loved hydroponics. Oh, wow. My mom was on the other end of the scale. She's fully organic. I mean, you know, as organic as you could be back in 1970s. Yeah. And, uh, so they each had their own input to me. So I learned hydroponics really well, really fast, the whole dynamic of it. And yeah. my mom taught me organics. And the first thing I did, of course, was I flopped into hydroponics and, you know, started uh, building systems and designing them. And uh, that worked out really good. And I look back now at that and I think, Man, we really sure thought we had some great buds back then, but I won't even touch a synthetic grown bud these days. I mean, do you remember those old catalogs from Sensi Seeds? Like the pictures of the buds back then, just all chewed up and rotten. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah dude. It was a different time, man. Well, but I hope you know, different. because of my, organic, my uh, hydroponic knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. I had met these guys in Northern California. And uh, they were super interested in hydroponics. They didn't know anything about hydroponics, and they wanted to know big time. Oh, I bet. So it was kind of a marriage made in heaven right there. I got together with them. They agreed to teach me their ways, and they were breeders and growers. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I would teach them hydroponics, so, I mean, that couldn't have worked out better. Yeah, no kidding. Apprenticeship made in heaven. Yeah. So what kind of stuff were you seeing around then? Was it mostly Mexican stuff that was coming in, import? No, no, these guys had connection with uh, the surfers, right, around the world, oh, okay. like uh, several pro surfers. So they were hooked up with some really prime genetics. That's why when people nowadays tell me, um, you know, oh, the weed now is so much more strong. Well, as a whole, yeah, mm -hmm. but not if you're a selector and you find a, a clone of something like Blue Mountain Jamaican or something, yeah. you know, something from Hawaii, something picked and selected. It was just... It was incredible weed. Thai, oh my fucking God. Yeah, see, I always hear these stories about the old ties, and that's why I've always kind of chased them. I, I looked up to you when I was, you know, getting into breeding and growing up, and I was like, wow, this dude's super into Thai. I want to see what this is about. I love Thai. Yeah, yeah, it's a special It's a special region that produced just, I don't know if it was the region that produced the incredibly special plants or the farmers were just better at it or, or how it worked plants from different regions are kind of similar sometimes it's like central americans mm -hmm. are kind of close to southeast asians you know they have a lot in common yeah where like colombians and south americans are have some similarities with south africans and africans like the Rui bart right from yeah, south yeah. africa and uh like a colombian red a good a good strong real colombian red they're very similar. It would be tough to tell them apart by high tide. And I've always tripped out about that. You know, I thought, well, there must have been some boats going around exchanging genetics way back then. Yeah. And you, you wonder about like it, maybe they were just, you know, similar e equator, similar elevation, yeah. shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the genes are similar, too, because 
I mean, you can grow, you can have something like a Durban poison from South Africa that is miles different than a Rui Bard or a Colombian. Oh, sure. You know, but but there are there are strange similarities across the table that always make me wonder what happened in the past, how they got there. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, man. I've seen some pretty weird ones. Like uh, there's a lot of that terpenaline in a lot of Colombians, but in a lot of Mexicans, there's skunkiness. And you think there would have been a lot of trade going up and down through there, but they did keep their own little separate divisions too. It's wild. And they're, you know, they're, they're those like the Mexicans, especially they're, uh, they're like the South Africans too, in a way is that at first, you know, when people are looking for all the terpenes, looking for the smells and the flavors, they're always like, Oh, this smells like lemon. Oh, well, that's super common at the early stages of flowering, right? Yeah. For a lot of sativas to smell sure. that way. They don't really start to put their real smelly legs on until at least halfway through. So what were some of the first lines that you were um, making crosses of? What were some of the first crosses, even before breeding, just your first like? Oh, my God. Let's see. God, you know what? I can... The first ones, I find it hard to remember. I remember I had a, uh, I remember I had a tackle box. Oh, yeah, the cops got that. I had a tackle. <laughs> I had a tackle box just full of a big one labeled uh -huh. just full of all kinds of I wish I could remember some of them now but damn I just I just can't. I Is don't it mostly remember. regional varieties? Yeah, some of them are regional, some of them I got from France, some of them I got, you know, online having to read the catalog and mail and go yeah, through. Yeah, yeah. And then uh let's see when was it that when Seabay came online around that time. Okay, so early, night Early, early 2000s, 90s, late 90s. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. When they came online, I started really digging on the availability of online stuff. And of course, you know, you run the risk of crap, but oh, yeah, I found some real gems back then just popping around, talking to people. There was crap too, but still, I mean, is that is that the era that you got the metal haze? Yeah, that was the, from Dutch Flowers. Yeah, it was. And in fact, you know, you and I were talking about the having to select things southeast asians like hazes right yes and uh that that metal haze it was funny because if i recall i got uh i think i got six or eight females out mm -hmm. of a tent pack and pretty much most of them were average and okay yeah a, cu a couple of them were better than okay and then that one they're like oh my god you know i yeah. mean it just it stood out like a beacon so yeah, you that, was, get, that was lucky, really. That was lucky because really you usually have to go through a lot more than that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially in haze varieties because it's just so much. Any 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 sativa that has like mostly a land race history is going to be a real good selection because wild plants keep their options open. You know what yeah, I mean? They, they sure do. They keep a big genotype on reserve to tap. So they, they don't really, unless they're super, super old. Like yeah. like the deep chunk or Panama red or Thai, some things like that. Yeah. They're just they're set in their ways just like old people. They aren't changing. Yeah, yeah. Deep chunk's perfect for that. Yeah. Um, you so, know, they're just they're real they're real acclimated to whatever environment they were inbred five hundred times into or whatever. Exactly. Deep chunk just loves the Mendo and that's it. You know, like the Mendo outdoor is perfect for it. People have big problems with it when their pH usually runs low. Oh, really? You know, yeah, because, uh, you know, it won't tolerate a normal pH. If, if your pH runs 6.8, 6.7, mm -hmm. you're going to have small issues with it. Your pH has to be up around 7 for it to really kick ass. That's awesome. I didn't even know that part. I've had trouble with it on and off in the past. Yeah, I guess it's because it's from the desert, basically. Yeah, that makes sense. So it's used to a lot of minerals, probably a super high soil pH with pretty low organic content. So yeah, it makes a little bit of sense. Yeah, it sure does. Um, so what was let's 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 talk about the first strain that you actually started breeding breeding, a line you started working. Damn. I think I used I think I had a damn, I really just can't remember. <laughs> how old are you son i'm 62 <laughs> i've been doing this for half a century i know i guess it gets harder over time I, you know over the years it's gotten a lot harder for me to remember some of the earlier years it used to be just like bam bam oh, just just wait till you pass 55 brother i know i can't i'm already I, I, i'm all about walking in the kitchen and going what am i doing <laughs> 
no, I swear, it looks like a mad scientist thing around here. I got, I got sticky notes, and my Google Calendar's busy all day long. You know, oh, I, I need bet. all that shit to remind me of what the fuck I'm doing all the time. See, I haven't even gotten to the point of utilizing that, so I just forget and say fuck it and go smoke again. I just, I give up. I oh man, I can't myself. do that because you know <laughs> when I'm when I'm especially if I'm selecting like I am now. Yeah. If I screw up even once, man, now I have now I have a whole new set of variables I have to take into account. That's true. You know, I mean, it's like I, I can't tell you how many people I visit. They're trying to select a clone that'll have like a closet or a small area of plants, right? Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, "Yeah, well, I'm going to kill these three because they're not doing well." And I'll be like, "Wait a minute." You know, your fan is blowing extra strong on those three back plants. Yeah. So what's really happening is they're dehydrating faster. They're needing water sooner. So the reason they look shitty isn't genetics. It's yeah. because you got to understand the environment around them, right? Yeah. That's like selecting in veg, like culling in veg. Like, oh, it doesn't grow well. Well, it could be the one that's the most potent. We're going for effect, not for structure. In, in veg, you know, if you're super familiar with the line, Mm -hmm. like, like I am with most yeah, of mine. Yeah. Because I'm like uh, the embodiment of Tasmania or uh, the Galapagos Islands, right? I have a pretty sealed gene pool. Yeah, you do. You do. I don't walk outside of my gene pool very often. Mm -hmm. So it, it works out really good for me. Yeah. I mean, that's that's one of the best ways to truly learn your lines and to master a line, to really, really get it into, to, I mean, for lack of a better word, to master it, to to get that bud grown to its best expressions to where you're familiar and, and you know i use marker expressions on lines i'm real familiar with like my own lines i've worked with a lot i know if a if i have a square petiole right on this mm -hmm. one i know that 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 is a link gene to something i either want or don't want as an example yes. right okay i get what you're so, saying so i can select early i can wipe out a lot of plants i know i don't want early right in veg with things i'm familiar with so, so for I, people listening like a, a linked trait could be like you see a leaf, certain leaf mutation, so you know that in that line it happens to also denote another trait. And right, like, and oh. a lot of times, a lot of times it gets a lot deeper than that, like yeah. patterns of uh, leaf hairs, the yeah. patterns that they form in certain places on the plants. One of my one of my favorite things to do to be able to check plants early is uh, I look at those. You know the little round I forget what they're called, coital zones or whatever. Oh, the little leaves, yeah. leaves that come up on the sprouts, right? Yeah. Those are uh, those are some of my favorites. When I catch the plants about a week up above ground, I always yeah. take a thirty times scope and look really close at those leaves and look at the density of the leaf hairs. Now, what that does is, since leaf hairs and trichomes are pretty much exactly the same, just a little tiny move on the plant okay. to be different. I then know which is most dense, which can have the most dense trichomes right from go. This helps me a ton for males. So if I'm no selecting a, a male from something I'm a little familiar with or not that familiar with, I can get a good grip on how what my potential is in my males to to pass off heavy resin production with the female for the offspring, right? Yeah, that, that gives me my first little marker, so I can you know do that. Hang on, I'm gonna grab. Oh, all right, okay, all right. <laughs> that reminds me, I got one too. There we go. No, but that's, that's so something I, mean, I never, never even considered. That's amazing. Oh, well, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, the leaf yeah, hair, thing, the leaf hair things are big. I use them to judge a lot of things, and it's like um, most people go right to the leaves. They look at like leaf formations, leaf, whatever, some some aspect expression of the leaf, yeah. and those work good. Those work good for a lot of things, but the problem is. With different environments and with any strain, especially a hybrid, if it's not an IBL, yeah, it will, uh, it, it'll throw out just on the notch. It'll throw out different morphologies, different resin values, you know, because it's sure. still testing the water. It's a hybrid. Yeah. Right. That's yeah, what it's exactly. doing. It's getting a grip on the world. Yeah. And, and in today's society, we know like almost everything's a poly, 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 poly hybrid in the cookie world, unless Holy you're, shit. unless you have a, a nice sealed environment away from that kind of BS like yours. <laughs> well, you know, my worry is I, I, it's not that I think anything is particularly bad or particularly good in, in the recent 20 years or so. But the problem I have is, is it's, is it's useless for me to try to run down the origin of some type of genetics that I get because I'm involved with two or three people at least with, 
one or two of them at least have just gotten it and decided to rename it something else and maybe yep. embellish on the history. So I just I just don't trust anything I hear now. So I have my uh, my Galapagos Islands gene pool that I had. And man, I got a lot of seeds from a long time ago. I'm just working through them now. Like I told you recently, I just got a G. I just got some G13 haze from Soma to pop. And yeah, that's are, freaking awesome. got to be 30 years old. Oh yeah, I bet those are. That's a really good line too. I think that's where they found the the CBD stuff. A lot of the the CBD basis for canatonic and stuff like that was in someone's G13 haze. Well, the haze would definitely have some CBD. Yeah, yeah, right. But yeah, because it's not just the resin production, you know. I mean, mm -hmm. a lot like with uh, let me think of it. Oh, like let's take a Congo for example. Okay, sure. several times I've seen Congos that suck. Right. Yeah. Several times I've seen Congos that look like they'd be okay. You know, it's like a real dark, spooky looking bud, mm -hmm. but you don't see much resin, you know, it just does, and it will kick your ass. I mean, bad, right? Yeah. And if you were to chop that bud in half and look at it, you would see that it forms its, different, its resin different than an indica would. You know, a lot of the indicas were bred to make hash, right? Yeah. So they always wanted the resin spread out all over the whole plant so they could all extract it with hash. Yep. Sativas are a lot different, especially some of the really wild ones. Yeah. They'll condense their resin production as you get closer to the core of the flower to protect it from the weather, basically, is what yeah. they do for. But that's why you can have a sativa that to your naked eye, you can go, oh, yeah, that looks all right. And it will lay you out. Yeah. I mean, you look at a lot of these old sativas. I was looking at some Highland Thai bud I had from Bodhi Save. And if you look at it, like, if, I guess if a modern person that, like, in the that started growing in the 2020s looked at it they wouldn't even understand what to smoke on it because it's almost all leaf you know there's no floral density to it whatsoever yeah, yeah yeah no we had those a matter of fact when i went to northern california they had just gotten pretty flush with those exactly yeah right those the ones from afghanistan and the mid east that were not really buds right they were just like leaf bud florets or something yeah 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 and uh and they were just covered in resin you know it would just yeah. be these big non-dense flowers just soaked with resin jesus so let's talk about some of your lines i mean you've made a lot of i mean so many lines over the years one of your flagships is the uh what is it the blue rhino 1947 love it let's talk about that one it's one of your okay. staples. When I when we first started talking, I think that was one of the big ones you were working with. Man, I still love it. It's one of my favorite go-to smokes of all time. It's it's kind of heavy on the indica side, but you wouldn't know it by smoking it because it doesn't really relate that kind of sleepy side too much. Yeah, it, it doesn't give you munchies too much. But what it does do is it it reminds me a lot. I I mentioned Bhutan earlier as it, mm -hmm. it reminds me of some Bhutanese right that have this this resin profile where the high type is like, I don't know how to describe it other than it's golden and happy, right? Yeah. Everything is like golden and you're happy. And that's what the Blue Rhino does. The Blue Rhino 1947 does for me, but it's most unique property that I have found in nothing else mm -hmm. is that I have some, I, I have a lot of damage actually, but mm -hmm. one of my major damage zones is in my leg. Right. And I took some really bad nerve damage. Now, yeah. the problem is, is when I'm up and walking around because of all that damage, along with bone damage and other stuff. But when I'm up and walking around, I have to hold my muscles in that leg tight. Right. Yeah. Because any loose, if I step down a step that's not there or something, man, I'm done. I'm on I'm on a, a cane for a week. I know what you mean. Yeah, it's bad. Right. Yeah. So. The Blue Rhino 1947, after a day when I lay down to go to sleep, of, of, if I'm up and around, right, my leg will get spasms when it relaxes. Yeah. Right. And that hurts the hell out of me. Oh, I'm so, sure. So the Blue Rhino 1947, I can just pop some of that. And those spasms are just reduced to a tiny, tiny little rumble that doesn't hurt at all. So while I don't use it for pain relief directly, it mm -hmm. absolutely cures me from the pain I would be suffering. So I always have Blue Rhino 1947, always. always. So do you think that's from the blueberry side or what's in the blue rhino? I, it's a uh, blueberry white rhino and peak 19 and AK 47. Peak 19 and AK 47. That's right. Right. Very I got cool. the, uh, I got the uh, peak 19 AK 47 from Seabay many, 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 many moons ago. 
Do you remember yeah, who made that one? Pardon me? Do you remember who made that one? I know it's a hybrid of Sager Matha and something else, but I do not know who made that one. Yeah, but I cool. use but I use the Irish Rose version of Blue Rhino. Very cool. And uh I just crossed them up and uh, you know I, it's a it's an impactive line anyway. I mean the high is impressive, but mm -hmm. even beyond that, I started noticing that stuff with the tremors in my leg and went, Oh, there really is medical marijuana. Yeah. I, you know, the first time I realized that was when I had, uh, um, uh, for myself anyways, I had a, a abscess tooth, an abscess molar. And it was just, it was one of those ones where it was like tears running down your face. It's the only thing you can feel in your body is that pain just throbbing and nothing was working. Dabs, nothing. And then I smoked some very weak blueberry just because I happened to have it and it completely took away the nerve pain. And I realized, oh, this, this for me helps with nerve pain insanely like a whole bunch. So I was wondering if that maybe helped you. Any at of the blue first, stuff? At first, I really thought it was the blueberry. Mm -hmm. I, I did for several years, I thought it was the blueberry. But then as I started to inbreed them and mess with them and look at different ones that were better at exactly that nerve damage stuff, yeah, I noticed that the ones I would select that would be the best would morphologically, they would look the most like the peak 19. Oh, interesting. Not the blueberry. So I just kind of naturally made the leap and thought it must be the peak 19 that's doing it. But I could I could be wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, the, the blueberries that I've had usually smell like blueberry, the ones that helps my nerve pain, because I have neuropathy bad. Oh. And that tends to help me a lot. But I also like when you mentioned white rhino, like one of my white whales is white rhino, like a very good white rhino cut. Because I had one. It's just the one time ever that weed has made me see tracers and hallucinate like lsd and it was white rhino so ah, man that's a special line yeah yeah we used to smoke a ton of white rhino when we were out taking care of stuff outdoors and white rhino works really good outdoors because it's also hardly smelly at all when you grow it yeah let's see we have your riff raft tie which i know is a popular one that's um, a, that's that's a real grape a grapefruity baby right there, man. Oh, some people are, are hunting grapefruit right now. People keep talking about it too. Oh shit, the riffraff tie is like you could call it grapefruit. I mean, you know, I just want yeah. people to know that there was tie in it. Yeah. But uh and that it's, you know, kind of muggled up, not pure tie. But mm -hmm. I mean, damn, you talk about grapefruit. That that baby is full on grape with a cure, it just gets ten times stronger. It, it's radical. What's in the what's in it? Riff Raff tie is a uh, deep chunk. And let's see, which tie did I use? I can't remember if it was the, I had gotten sent from my cousin in Vietnam. And when he sent it to me, the, the paper or whatever it was wrapped in said bat damn bang on it. Right. Uh -huh. So I just called that bat damn bang tie. <laughs> That's a good name too. Uh, and then the other tie I had that I worked with, was from a breeder that I hooked up with that was in uh, Denmark or Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to trade me some juicy for a tie. Oh, yeah. For uh, something I had. I forget what it was, but I was like, oh, hell yeah. And uh, that was legit juicy for a tie. I mean, yeah. it was lo long flowering, smelled just like juicy fruit gum, was kick ass. So in the Riff Raff tie, I forget which one it was, but it was one of those. One of those two. It'll say so in the description. Yeah. So check the if description. If only I had a photographic memory. Yeah. Yeah. I see. I need one of those too. Mine's just damaged, 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 like memento. Me too. <laughs> so um, if anybody's interested in the website, it's kingdomorganicseeds.com. Definitely go out, go check those out there. Um, we want to talk about some more of your stuff. Let's see. I know my friend Smellboat would kill me if I didn't ask about the cherry tie. The chunky cherry tie. Yeah. Now you know something. This I love that for so many reasons. But the the first thing I really liked about it was when I saw the offspring. I knew because sometimes when you're working with like it usually happens with a land race or or an heirloom long IBL when you pop it into a hybrid. Mm -hmm. Usually what will happen is they will just merge. Right. It'll mm -hmm. it'll the resulting will be uniform and it will blend. Yeah, it's pretty uniform sometimes, in the F1. Sometimes that doesn't happen. Sometimes it's like they resist each other a little, and mm -hmm. you de definitely get lots of different recombinations. 
That's what happened with the chunky cherry tie. So as soon as I saw some starting to finish at about 10 or 11 weeks and I saw others that had two more weeks to go, I was like, oh, yeah, I knew. And then, oh, my God, when I smoked them, there was one I had that was a 14 week finisher and it was uh, so close to just tie. Yeah. I mean, it, it was just like smoking tie. It was slightly different, but not very. And so I treasure that one. I still have deep stash buds of that. That's awesome. <laughs> Do you oh, keep man, them in the it, freezer? It's incredibly like tie. I mean, it's almost spot on. That's really cool. I know um, my friend Smellboat used just the cherry tie part in his uh, rainbow, and it's one of oh. his favorite lines. Yeah, the cherry pot tie. Yeah, that's one. You need a little selection there, but there yeah. are. One out of four of those females are just stellar. They're all good. You don't yeah. you don't have any bad ones, but there's like, you know, out of out of like four females, you would probably get two average ones, one really good one, and one epic one if it spread the if it spread the bandwidth. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. If it even distribution of the, the expressions. Yeah. Yeah. Let's see what else we got. We have um let's talk about do you remember a string called Uncle Lucius Lemonade? I still have Uncle Lucius Lemonade. I remember that was a big hit on Skunk Magazine's uh, forums back in the day. The Uncle Lucius Lemonade. All my friends po- were grabbing them, popping them, loving it. What was that one about? I've almost popped it here in the last uh, six months. I've almost popped it twice. I mean, I've had it out and ready to roll. Yeah. And then you know, something else came up and I went, oh, and had to go a different direction. Yeah, but I'm definitely going to rework that again. The only problem is it takes a lot of work. Like I was talking to you earlier about if I'm working with things I'm really familiar with, right? Yes. Like, uh, you know, Blue Ryan 1947, let's say I can pop eight. If I want to continue the line, I can usually get away with one wave of eight sprouts. Mm-hmm. I can select from there and be good. Find everybody I'm looking for. Yeah. Maybe I might have to do that twice, but usually not because. I'm familiar with it. I know what I'm looking for. Exactly. So that works out really good. But the Uncle Lucius Lemonade. Now that's made from a lemon wreck that a friend of mine brought me in about 2004, I think. Mm-hmm. A lemon wreck clone up from Northern California, up from Willits. Um, it, uh, it was an intense train wreck. Super yeah. lemony. It, it must have developed a sport mutation or something. Mm-hmm. And it had become super lemony. Well, that? <laughs> okay. There we go. So, so, but it also had another couple other weaknesses that may have come along with the lemony flavor was it was real weak. It had no structural integrity and stuff. Yeah. So I crossed it with another heavy, hard hitter, the Iron Cindy, which is a lot like a train wreck. Yeah. And um, so I crossed it with that to make Uncle Lucia's Lemonade. Now, the problem with the original uh, Uncle Lucius was, or with the original Lemon uh, lemon Wreck, was that it had some Hermes in it, right? Yeah. You had to weed those out, and they weren't the easy kind to weed out. They weren't true Hermes. They were the kind you don't find out until two weeks before. It yeah, made. those brutal. Right. Just, just weak breeding, right? Yeah. So... Uh, so I have to fish through them. So now in order to run those and inbreed them, I'm going to need to run 16 sprouts mm-hmm. to start with and, and cross my fingers that I can find what I need in that run because those are particularly dangerous. Uh, first, I have to find true males for sure. Yeah. Then I have to find a female that can take some stress. I have to beat the shit out of them to find out who has the least tolerance for stress. Yeah. So once I find that, I will do it because... That is some of the most lemony stuff, man, ever. I think people run into that a lot with the train wreck stuff, a lot of um, intersex traits and a lot of like there's even auto flowering traits in the line somewhere. And but man, it, for me, there's not a much better hide than train wreck stuff. It's one of those ones just that I associate with Thai type highs kind of in there that, that kind of. make me happy, energetic, just now Thai makes me happy and energetic for sure. Yeah. Sometimes it's totally spaced out, depends on how much I smoke. Mm-hmm. But uh but the train wrecks, any train wreck I've ever smoked, I'm not a big fan. Uh, oh, they're potent, that's mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. But they have a they have a quality to me mm-hmm. that is not dissimilar than when you uh take something two weeks late. Mm-hmm. You know how the resin changes? Yeah, yeah. 
that's that's how they always remind me of. I've even tried taking them a little early, and that doesn't change. Yeah. But you know, it's just that's a personal thing. Like you sure. and millions of people love train wreck. Yeah. I, mean, I think I'm nothing against it, other than the fact that it just kind of makes me feel eh, like it's like it's weed that was taken too late. I always get that vibe from it. You know, with train wrecks, people either and it's kind of like that with Jack Harrow too a little bit. Maybe it's because of the terps, maybe it's because of the high too, but it's either people love it or they're just like, man. And some people it makes speedy and paranoid, like crazy paranoid. And it just never does it to me. But a lot of Afghanis do it to me and skunk one does it to me. But yeah, it's weird. Oh man. You want to see the queen of paranoid, that black forest I have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about some of the black forest. Let's talk about that one. Oh man. I can't tell you how many people I've sent running for the hills with that. Where they go, yeah, yeah well, I do get a little paranoid. I go, well, I wouldn't <laughs> smoke it if I was you, if that's the case, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, they don't listen. And, uh, you know, they run for the hills because that thing's just uh, a pure jungle black Vietnamese. Who knows how many bazillion years old it is. Yeah. Uh, cross with my old cherry bomb mail, which, God, I love that cross. What, because which, What was the cherry bomb? That was an F3 out of Hawaii. That was okay. uh, it was a combination of about three or four Hawaiian sativas, elephant ear, puna butter, a couple others, and mm -hmm. it was crossed with a cherry AK forty seven. Oh wow! Then it, in, then it was inbred a few times to F three, and it was shared with me under some kind of top secret, you know. How the Hawaiians do? They 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 do. They are tight with their stuff. Oh, yeah, top secret. So yeah. anyway, when I got it, the first thing I noticed, the first couple of things I crossed it with, is it was sort of uh, it was sort of submissive. You know, mm -hmm. it would impart larger yields and it would impart added resin, but it wouldn't really contribute too much to terps or or high type or morphology to any big degree. So I really liked it because I could blend it with almost anything and it would come out mostly whatever else was in the hybrid. Yeah. You know, it would always be like 80-20 instead of a 50-50. Yeah. So yeah, I love that. So anyway, I bled I bred that with the with the with the Vietnamese black, which I got from my cousin back in I don't know, I think it was like maybe the late 80s or something. So you've kept the Vietnamese black uh, long, uh, line around that long? Yeah, I still have it. I just popped 3 a few months ago because I just inbred the uh I just inbred the uh black forest mm -hmm. by getting a mail from the original V black line. Oh, nice. And using him to do a soft back cross yeah. to, to the Black Forest. So now it's like the Black Forest runs over anything it crosses anyway. Oh, wow. You know, How long does it flower? 16 weeks. Oh, I bet. That's got to be so killer, though. Oh, my God. But, you know, peeps have problems with it because yeah. if you never have flowered a 16-week plant in a container, you may have some issues. Yeah, yeah. People that aren't used to <laughs> used to land races and heirloom lines and long flowering lines indoors you really yeah. gotta do your homework before you start flowering them puppies oh yeah 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 because you know shit not only do you have to select the shit out of them and keep them over loving them is the death sentence to them you know yeah you start trying to pour food on them or switch their ph faster and you're bone overwatering you know? all kinds of shit it goes plus wrong. people people will take them as the common mistake with a black forest or anything that's like up 14 weeks or something is they'll get to about the 10 11 week mark and they'll be oh shit my plant's dying yeah i need to transplant it well that's like the worst possible thing you could do in flowering because mm -hmm. suddenly the plant gets this dose of all kinds of available nitrogen and shit so mm -hmm. it says yay time to veg and what that means is time to reduce resin production yes, yes so if you're in flowering and you're reducing resin production well that's not right yeah counterintuitive <laughs> as fuck that's that's how that's why i tell people you're feeding cannabis not tomatoes because tomatoes like some nitrogen and calcium and veg and stuff but cannabis it, nitrogen kills resin production in flower yeah i mean it. sure your plant will get really happy and start to grow really yeah. fast maybe even mutate growth a little bit but well it's like with tomatoes like if if you were overdosing your tomatoes with nitrogen at the end, if you weren't yeah. sort of fading your tomatoes, you'll get really big, gnarly tomatoes, but they'll robust. have a big, thick skin. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah. Super thick, robust, thick skin. Yeah. 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 So one of 
the lines that I probably associate with you the most and that I get asked about the most when people ask about your lines is Iron Cindy. People love, it. That's love the Iron Cindy. It's basically a haze for yeah. my money. You know, it, it's like, it's just like a faster flowering haze. It's a slightly longer flowering Cindy because Cindy and Hayes have a lot in common. Cindy and Southeast Asian have a lot in common. Yeah. So the the so the the metal haze was kind of a no brainer that I wanted to cross with it. You know, it, it kind of makes a really nice outdoor plant too for the for the metal haze, a better frame for it and everything else. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what kind of what kind of terps are you seeing in the the Iron Cindy? Is it did you use a pineapple C ninety nine a grapefruit? What kind are you using? No, in no, I just used uh, I just selected some. I think I used a couple of females for that, mm -hmm. maybe more than a couple. But uh, I just took some good Cindys and crossed it. It's hard to get a bad Cindy. Yeah. The only the only bad Cindy are every once in a while I would say one in eight are yeah. super small yielding. Yeah. That's the only really bad Cindy I've ever seen. And that's not bad. It just yields really small. Yeah, but it probably has heavy resin production and all oh, that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's funny. That's funny, too, because you know something in any line I've ever seen. Yeah. If you have, you know, usually they're big, fat plants. Usually if you get one, a, a, a phenotype that has, like, let's say 25% less yield. Yeah. It will also have about 25% <laughs> more potency. Yeah, and right. resin production it puts all that energy elsewhere for the yeah, plant. Man. I love I love cannabis. I love yeah, how 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 just intuitive it is as a as a plant and how how quickly it adapts everything everything about the plant. It evolves. Right. Um, a lot of times we talk about on our show about like expressions and clonal expression, meaning you know a lot of people used to call it genetic drift, but it's not necessarily a thing. But taking a clone from one environment to another and watching how quickly it adapts how quickly it will change its form even. You, my man, know the important stuff, if you ask me, because yeah. that is it. Now, I call it adaptability as a general. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, one of the first things I do to my plants to check them out is, well, back in the day, we used to call it, the breeders in Northern California used to call it growth hormone. Mm -hmm. Okay, And what it is, is basically when you take a plant and you top it, right? Yeah. You see how fast it comes back with the axial branches. Yeah. And then you top it again. See how fast it comes back with the axial branches. Top all those. And you see how many times before you actually slow the process. Yeah. Now, of course, you got to keep the resources all in line here during this. Sure. You know, you got to have container size and food and water because, you know, it's now putting up 20 leads or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Or whatever. But but that's how you can tell a plant has like the superior vigor from hell. If it can come back four times and still be just ju the Hemingway, one of the mm -hmm. ones I worked with a long time ago. The cherry Hemingway? Is that what it is? Well, before it was the cherry Hemingway, it was the Hemingway. Oh, okay. And it's a Bhutanese mad plant. Okay. And, uh, that thing, man, my friends would tell me it's broken out of the grow room window and ate the neighbor's dog. <laughs> I mean, you talk about vigor, you could just, you prune the shit out of that plant and you just make it mad. I mean, it comes back, that's adaptability right there. Is it the that's pure one the things, That's one of the things I always look for with all my breeders is I test them that way. You know, I always yeah. talk the crap out of them and see how fast they come back. And also I take advantage of any incidents I might have where if my tent went away, all of a sudden it's 110 in there. I'm like, oh shit. I, then I watch those plants very closely for the I next bet. two yeah. weeks. I see who handled that best or or if something happens where I, I drought them all out and they all hurt from drought stress. That's a really good opportunity to see what's up. Yeah, yeah, that's a great way to see what's up with your plants and their ability to test for stress and every, Yeah, because I mean they got they got to be they got to be strong first and foremost, you know. Yeah. When I'm selecting them, I don't want any weaknesses in there at all. Once I've got it down to all the strongest plants, then I go to work on resin production, terps. I see what's up with all that. So aside from your breeding work, which is is completely prolific, it's really well known. And like you said, it's its own kind of ecosystem where you've kept it very pure in its own form. And, and rarely do you bring anything in. You're also very well known for your true living organics. You have a book out from Green Candy Press called True Living Organics. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about, let, let's, let's do a, a step-by-step, -step, quick, 
basic organic introduction like you would you would teach a beginner give them your your best advice that you would give a beginner starting into organics okay tlo is simply an all natural style okay when i say all natural style i do mean organic yeah but all organic styles aren't all natural that's right. Yeah. I could be growing organic with my earth juice bottles and it would not be all natural. Exactly. It would be organic. Yes. So that's the first difference there. TLO is an all natural style. There's no liquid, anything, no synthetics. We don't cram organic acids in there to force feed them. Yada, yada. No synthetic processes in any of it. Or even any high or organic acids in any prolific amounts. Okay. And, um, then the next thing you need to know about TLO is we leverage mother nature, right? We yeah. take some advantage of the plants being in containers like higher root temperatures. Yeah. That means there's more, you know, you've seen an anthill on a sunny day compared to an anthill on a cloudy day. Yeah. You know, they're moving like lightning on the sunny day and they're yeah. all just screwed. All right. Same with your plants. When the roots are, the temperature around the roots in a container are warm like that. That's pretty alien to the plant, but. Mother Nature comes to the rescue, takes advantage of that, and we can leverage all those things, right? Yeah. Get those warmer temperatures and the right balance, the right pH, the right food, the right aeration, the right container dynamics. You put the, the right water. You yeah. put all those together, and not only is it all natural growing, it's freaking supernatural, yeah. right? And I mean literally, not it's just a tagline. To... Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Supernatural. Yeah. So we were getting into um, the second part, the second question of uh, best advice you would give a TLL grower. Right, right. The second part is from the movie Ghostbusters, do not cross the streams. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. This is one of the most important things and what fucks up the most people most often, right, is mm -hmm. – they have their grow going really good. Everything's cranking along and they decide to add some sweet or some, you know, super thrive or some kind of elixir or, yes. you know, because that just does, you, once you get how the all natural process works, it's all about consistency, right? Yes. It's yeah. all about the plant and the soil all getting used to their environment. The changes don't come rapidly. They come slowly. The plant loves it like that because yeah. it grows super slowly, right? Exactly. You can't just blast in a bunch of phosphorus or or some kind of radical fulvic acid solution in there and think everything's going to be okay because the first thing it's going to do is change the pH in the soil radically. Yeah. Now, if you're a human, you might go, cool, more food. Mm -hmm. But if you're a micro life in the soil, you die. Yeah. Right? And it takes a whole two weeks for that to come back to where it should be after a mistake like that. And if that two weeks is during flowering, well, as we discussed before, you're taking the way from resin production. Yeah. Yeah. Instantly, instantly you're, yeah. you're boofing your bud. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I don't get why anybody would go through all that process of having this beautiful organic living soil and add in just a little thing. But I guess that temptation is always there though, right? Like for, for people that are used to bottles, grabbing that bottle real quick to make a for quick sure. adjustment. For know? sure, I understand it. My God, yeah. when I was making the transformation myself, I boned that one many times myself. I bet, I bet it's gotta be a common habit. So- Well, right out of the gate, the problem, the problem is, is right out of the gate, when you pour some of that on, on your plant, oh, your plant looks wicked happy for a week, maybe 10 days. Oh yeah, it loves it. You go, man, I made a great move. Then all of a sudden it starts going to hell and you're like, what's wrong? Well, it's because it catches up in time. Right? Yeah. So if you're gonna go TLO, stay TLO. Do not mix. Super yeah, important. give it a fair give it a fair shot, you know. Don't don't decide when you've got, you know, a couple or a few weeks left to go before harvest that you need a phosphorus boost. Yeah. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. No kidding. Yeah. So when when did you start your writing career? I mean this is a big part of your career is writing, not just growing and writing about growing, but actually being an author. When did that kind of come about? Um, I uh, met up with a guy who was a writer. His name was Gooey. Mm -hmm. Just met with him online, right? 
Do and we I, didn't know, I didn't know shit about writing. Yeah. I, mean, I, I could I couldn't even spell the word the word article consistently. Yeah. Right? I would spell it wrong. I spelled all kinds of things wrong. My sentence structure sucked. Anyway, so he proposed an idea where it, he wrote for Skunk Magazine at that time. Mm -hmm. So he proposed an idea where we would collaborate, right? And we would just do some stuff together. Yeah. So I, I stuck with him for probably, I don't know, it was like a year. But what we would do is I would write, then I would send it to him. Okay. Then he would, he would fix it. Mm -hmm. And then he would send it back to me. And then I would say, yeah, yeah. Because sometimes if you don't know how to grow and you're editing somebody's writing, you screw it all up because you don't know what you're saying. Absolutely. So along with correcting those kind of things, I also took really careful note on the writing corrections he made. Yeah. I started to get a grip on how he wrote, how he structured his sentences, blah, blah, blah. So after about two years, I guess, a year and a half of that, I uh, broke out on my own and just started writing. And, and I did okay for a while and slowly came up more and more and more, you know, in my skills of writing. Sure. And then uh, at, uh, at one point when Skunk went digital, they mm -hmm. got the new, I forget what it's called, but the program that you uh, submit articles in, right? It's Okay. It, it's got all its own little rules, right? Mm -hmm. like, excuse me. Like how many, you know, words can be in a paragraph, how many paragraphs can be how many words and paragraphs can be under a heading and oh, all, wow. this weird, all this stuff yeah. that i wasn't really that familiar with so that trained me a little further so so now i can write pretty good you know standard issue pretty good i still have my own signature moves that i pull off that aren't you know classic writing skills but yeah for sure you know it's it's like whenever i'm writing i'm always imagining that i'm just sitting there talking to somebody you know, at a pub or something yeah. And I'm explaining whatever I'm writing to them. And it's funny because a lot of the people who email me, they say exactly that. They yeah. go, I swear, man, I feel like I'm just sitting next to you in a pub and you're just telling me stuff. Yeah, so. that's what I enjoy. That's what that's why early year writing resonated with me as I was growing up and, and reading skunk and doing all that. Like it always resonated with me because it's how I speak when I'm talking to someone. It's just familiar. You don't feel like someone's above you talking down to you. You just feel like it's a, a bro talking about growing. You know? Yeah, I mean, everybody has their own likes and dislikes. I respect that totally. You know, it's uh, it's like music or anything else or your sure. favorite food. You know, you have your favorites right now. Your favorites change sometimes. That's just the way it is. I go through, I go through periods where I'm just like, uh, oh god, I'm, yeah, I made some hash from some Cinderella '99 recently. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's a good move. That's, that's <laughs> a really good move. So anyway, I just got obliterated. I don't really. You know, for a for a writer of cannabis, an author, and a grower and a breeder, I don't really smoke as much weed as a lot of the people I know. Yeah, probably because I'm older now, because I sure used to. Yeah, but when I get something that's really fine in my hands, like that Cindy hash, I tend to go for you know maybe a week, just being the stoner from hell. I'm all da, yeah. walking around <laughs> baked on hash all the time. That's me when I start when I fire up the puffco. You know, there's a good week or two where I'm just stuck on stupid yep. for a while. And then I yep. go back to flower and kind of get back into it slowly. But yeah, yeah, that always. Yeah, yeah. because hash also blows your whole ability to smoke flowers, too, because it, it, raises, it raises your tolerance to a really high level. Super fast. Too. Super fast. Yeah. And that and that and that's no fun when you can't really enjoy the fine complexities of a high in a flower. Right. because Exactly. Exactly. Because I, I test stuff out, you know, where sometimes the route I take for breeding is I will use, uh, since I'm really good and fast at making hash, I'll take four plants, four females that I've never seen all the way through flowering, right? Mm -hmm. And I'll have my male or two or three or however many I'm using in there. Then, since I've seen this so many times, and especially if I'm using something I know, I can look at the plants as they seed up watch them very closely under magnification as they finish. And I can tell who's got the most resin production. And of course the turpins become obvious to me. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so what I do is, is I make separate hash balls from each female mm -hmm. because beyond the, the resin count, the resin production, you have the resin coating, right? The profile itself. Yeah. So, and that's what I'm really all about. I love that. So I just take days where, for three days, I smoke just hash from one, mm -hmm. you know, in the morning, noon, night, 
then the next day or, or the next set of days i smoke one, and it takes me you know a week or two to go through four or five different females sure but by the end of that i damn sure know which ones i like best yeah you have a good idea how it gets you because a lot of people like i mean i'm sure people realize this but i don't know that they consciously realize it a strain doesn't always affect the same person the same way at the same time of the day nor when you smoke it, in the nor morning will affect, nor will it affect you the same way at, under two different situations exactly right and, it's 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 so variant how a high will make you feel it could you could be smoking the exact same terps cannabinoid content everything but time of day mood everything matters when it comes yeah. to cannabis every yeah, last I, thing. I, I agree 100 percent. it's like uh one of my favorite things to do to test out especially sativas ones that are sativa dominant they're all just blaze of doobie or a couple hits or whatever and i'll yeah. but i'll blaze out on my bicycle and go riding around and see see what's up yeah, dude. I'll, I'll see what kind of energy motivation weed it really is. A lot of times I don't even get to really truly experience a high until I get up and move around and start, you know, getting some getting some action going. That's usually when I figure out how truly stoned I am. Exactly. <laughs> and, you, and you can take note of things along the way, like something stay consistent, like, oh, this is well. I ate that whole box of cookies, so I guess it gives you the munchies pretty hardcore, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. So you could tell some things stay the same, but as far as your attitude, as far as how it hits you mentally when you're on it, there's some that are just, like I say, those Bhutanese, mm -hmm. the Blue Rhino 1947, there's a few others I have that just make me have that golden, the life is beautiful thing. Yeah. And then there's, then there's those strains where, a stupid joke will make you laugh to where you almost choke to death. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just there's the so giggles. many different kinds out there. And, you know, I ran across somebody a couple of years ago, and, man, I'll always remember this guy. He comes up to me, he wants to smoke a doobie with me, and I'm like, dude, is it organic or whatever? He goes, I don't know, it's pot. He, <laughs> goes, he goes, but it's really, really powerful. And I, and I said, all right, well, let me have a hit of it. I smelled it. It smelled good. You know, I was like, yeah. okay. My first hit, I could see it was gnarly, synthetic, grown, like, so bad, it was like miracle grown, yeah. grown, yeah. right? It was like, oh, shit, I'm sorry. Don't want to piss you off, but that sucks, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, he goes, dude, you won't believe how high it gets you. And I go, let me let you in on a little secret here. I could spray the bud with Raid, and if you smoked it, you would get so fucked up, right? Yes. So it's not just about that, right? You know that they actually, um, I, I talked about this before on the show, back when I was in my teens in Bakersfield, most of the time we were getting in Mexican compressed during that during the 90s. We are getting Mexican compressed and we are yep. young. We didn't have access to dank up in Humboldt. We didn't have cars to drive around. We were young poor kids. Sure. But in a certain area of town, you could go get Mexican and it always had this weird floral perfumey smell to it. Later on, I found out they were spraying it with Raid because they would they would sell it and they'd call it Nade. So I thought that was the strain name. But later on, I found out they're spraying it literally with Raid. Well, it will get you really, really high. It sure will. <laughs> It'll fuck you up. Just, just take a shortcut and inhale some Raid if that's yeah. what you do, right? Huff on some Raid, yeah. Don't huff on Raid. No, <laughs> yeah. don't, don't huff on Raid, kids. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's shocking what people will do to their weed just to to give an effect, even if it has nothing to do with the natural processes of the plant or the high of cannabis. Right, right. I've converted many, many people just by giving them some weed, right? Mm -hmm. Because they'll hit me with a weed and they'll go, oh, this is the best weed. And, and I say, compared to what? Yeah. Right? Not compared to this. Yeah, <laughs> this little number. And yeah. I'll give them like a quarter ounce of it or something, mm -hmm. right? And within the time of no more than a few days, it never takes more than a few days. <laughs> Next thing they're doing, man, they're asking me how to do this. They want details. They're selling all their other shit. They think it's crap now because especially synthetics. I mean, if you're someone who can't tell the difference between synthetic grown weed and mm -hmm. organic or all natural grown weed, you need to solve that problem first because there is a hell of a difference. It means you're not smoking enough different good growers if you don't know the difference. Absolutely, because, yeah. man, that's synthetic weed. I could take one hit of real shitty synthetic weed. Oh, yeah. And my throat's through for the rest of the day. Yeah. Yeah, you're blowing out blowing out coughs out your throat all day. Yeah. It's all hot and shitty. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's pretty typical for it. So I mean, you know, if, if that's your gig, if that's what you like, and that's yeah, fine, fine, you know, but don't don't throw it on me and try to tell me it's organic. And don't tell me it's the best, you know, like if you haven't smoked a good sampling of all that's out there and a lot of different types of grown stuff, you really don't truly know until you have that experience and it, and it, it got the breadth until you can tell the difference between organic, you know, shitty synthetic and the, and the difference in between. It's not no, just it's, looking at the ash, you know, it's just that. Yeah. But, and that's just the elegance of the smoke. You know how elegant and smooth it is yes. when you're organic or all natural you're you're miles above anything synthetic all all the way yeah but, but from you know i've never smoked really organically grown bottle weed i call it soup style mm -hmm. organically grown weed with bottles that has been really offensive it, unless the person has decided to goose their plants at the end with a bunch of potassium and phosphorus you know yeah those, they, they, if they don't fade an organic bottle grow well it can be harsh. Nothing like synthetics can be. Yeah. But still, you can pick it up there. You know, I'm sure you've smoked those doobies where the, the cherry will sizzle like a sparkler a little bit. Yes, yes. That's, that, that's mega potassium still in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah I love mega potassium. Uh, yeah, so. and, yeah. I mean, if you're going to pour like heavy potassium or like phospho load on your plants at the end of an or, or a TLO grow, just, just don't, just don't, you're not going to fool anyone. Just, you're not, can't. I mean, potassium and phosphorus are both elements that you absolutely do not want to goose your plants with pretty much ever if you're in soil, no matter what you're doing. Yeah, because exactly. in nature, potassium and phosphorus don't come in highly available forms. They're taken in very slowly, slowly. and stored. And that's another thing with breeding that I also notice is along with like what we were talking about before, with how vigorous and what I used to call the growth hormone, right? Yeah. How how adaptable they are. Another thing with it, what was I just talking about? See how I am. <laughs> See how I am. Um, this, is, this is the curse of the old person. <laughs> it's okay, Mr. Magoo. You're, you're Wait, what am I doing? <laughs> Where did I go? <laughs> oh, okay. What was I talking about? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So it, potassium and phosphorus are just meant to be taken up super slowly over time, right? Like I yeah. said, and stored in the plant. And along with certain abilities of certain plants over other plants, one of those abilities is to be able to store and acquire nutrients like potassium, calcium, phosphorus. Some so you're plants talking about are, a breeding trait here. Some, yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're selecting, gotcha. yeah. some plants can store a, a lot of those nutrients. Some yes. can't. Some plants have a hard time getting it. Some plants don't. You know, it's just Absolutely. how well they work in synchronicity with the soil life. It's how how adaptable. I guess it's kind of their more wilder side coming back to them. Yeah. So one thing I noticed going through your stuff, I don't think you have any OG Kush in your lines, do you? No, I do not. I love that. I love that. I mean, I like OG Kush, but at the same time, the past 20 years has been bombarded. Everything has OG in it now. So you always yeah, have that yeah. turf profile somewhere in it. And I just realizing, wait a minute, this is this is an enigma. This is a, a, a thing you don't find very often. A breeder that's still going didn't work OG cushion their lines and is still successful making great lines. I mean, that's I mean, special. I, I like OG Kush, right? Yeah. It kicks my ass. I think it's that the guys who first made that were guys from Northern California who went down to LA, right? Yeah. Those were the so. guys, yeah. those are the guys who built that. So uh that was uh that was a devastating that's that's a that's a not a day wrecker because the legs aren't super long, but I mean yeah. it would be a day wrecker if the legs were longer. Yeah. Because it's sure. just disabling. I mean, it just if, if if I'm in bed and I feel like shit, OG Kush should be perfect, you know, just hammer yeah. me. Hammer yeah. me. I'm not gonna be doing much else besides maybe get a haircut and <laughs> watch a movie yeah. and, and not follow it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I you, mean, it, there's a time and place for that weed, but that's not usually my go-to type. So I didn't want to use it because I mostly breed with stuff I like. And yeah. even though I'm not the usual, I'm not the regular, I'm not the majority. Most people like strains and, and varieties that are different than the ones I like the most. I tend to lean a little more sativa in my likes, mm -hmm. or most people lean a little more indica in their likes. And it's not that I don't like indicas, it's just 
if I'm going to have a go-to weed that I'm going to, I'm a busy guy. I do a lot of shit all the time. Yeah. So I don't need something to hammer me down and make me eat some pancakes and go to sleep. Yeah. No, that don't help nothing. I, I want something where I could be high and happy, still functional. And I'm stoned as hell, but I'm still good to operate. It's not like, gah. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I just, I, I admire that. I admire that. Cause it's so easy to go with the crowd. I, you know, push OGs. Oh, things are going a little bit slower. Let's push some OG in there. That's what's hip now. You know, you just never did it. And I and I admire that. That's that punk rock ethos that I love about the Rev. Thank right you. I sure, I sure got offered enough of it, you know. I guarantee you did. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that, I mean, you were there for the beginning of it, the, you know, all of it. And you just, I, I love that you stuck to your guns. That's what makes you special. Oh. <laughs> so what's, what's the Rev's white whale? What's a strain that you that you either you had and lost or a strain that you're hunting a strain that you just always wanted or a terp profile that you've always wanted well i'm pretty good with making terp profiles i mean i'm usually pretty close i've seen enough of them blend so i know close to where they're going to go and then individuals yeah. in that batch i can usually find it you know yeah but as far as the the strain i would love to have back that the police got from me after I first moved here, mm-hmm. was my Panama Red clone. Oh, I bet. I One bet. of the craziest fucking plants you've ever seen. A jungle sativa, right? This thing would grow roots that would shoot straight up out of the ground for a couple inches. Then they would turn around and go straight back into the ground. So you'd have all these root loops above <laughs> the ground. And then new plants would start growing off of those. Of the What? That's yes. crazy. All right. You think that's weird? Let me tell you something else. <laughs> you know how the male plants in some strains, some rare varieties, they're usually land race heirloom types? Yeah, yeah. They have those nubs at the base of the stem. I don't mean it from it being too humid. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they actually have little nubs. Like, they reinforce the bottom third of their stems. Yeah. These, like, armor nubs, right? Sure. The Panama Red had spikes on those nubs. <laughs> That's so there weird. were pointy little like thorns on those nubs. I mean, you talk about a dinosaur freaking plant and DJ short absolutely described it to a T it mm-hmm. is the tequila of weed. What makes you say that? Like, it, is, it is psychoactive, man. It oh, is, man. it is, it is off your rocker down the rabbit hole, complete takeover of everything. This it's, is like, it, it wants you so thoroughly. You are like, it's almost like mushrooms. It really wow. is. Yeah, I mean, it just your auditory, your your visual, everything is affected hardcore. Your brain is just going twenty directions at once. It's like, it's like your head is zooming through space really fast. You know, you're just like, whoa, like that ad for those speakers that time. You yeah. Know? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Just like that, you're like, whoa, it's just <laughs> kicking your ass. And like a Durban poison, it has waves, right? Mm-hmm. So, and it's a creeper. So the first 10 minutes after you smoke it, you go, damn, damn. And then <laughs> five minutes after that, you go, oh, whoa, it's not done. 10 <laughs> minutes after that, holy shit. <laughs> it, it just keeps thumping you, and you just go deeper and deeper. It's a great, great. I've never seen the true clone of it or what looks to me like a true offspring of it anywhere. Yeah. So, so I haven't dabbled, but I never gave the clone to anybody, so I don't have any backup. So eh, the cops where, have gotten the cops have gotten a lot of really good strains. Where did you source that one? From a friend of mine down in uh, Nicaragua. Oh wow! Right? Yeah, he, him and I did well a long time ago. I used to get this hash right from Jamaica. Mm-hmm. This red hash, and we used to take the boat and go down to the uh, what are those islands just off sun just off in Mexican cat not Catalina. You know the islands just south of San Diego across the border? The ones that are named after the squid? Coronado Islands. Coronado Islands. Oh, Coronado. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, not Coronado, San Diego, but yeah, Coronado, Coronado Island. Island right? Yeah. Well, we used to rendezvous there, and I'd, I'd always get the hash there. Well, he was the one who was always talking about this. Oh, yeah, blah, blah, Panama Red. And as soon as he said that, of course, I was like, huh? Yeah, I bet. You know, Panama Red. And he goes, what, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, yeah, I have a clone. So I was like, well. Can you bring that with you next time? Yeah. And he was like, yeah, yeah, sure, I'll do that. He was real nonchalant about it for such a whoa, yeah. whoa. What year was this? 
82. Uh, oh my gosh, that's awesome. So yeah. This is legit shit, legit time for Panama Red to be going around and everything. Oh, well, you know, the closest thing to it now that if you could source, as far as I know, would be what was that stuff? The big Sir Hollyweed. Remember oh, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That has real Panama Red in it. Okay. Nice fucking potent, potent old sativa type. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Panama Red, the way you describe it reminds me of how Tom Hill talks about his haze, a specific vino in his haze. Uh, uh, it is a lot like killer hazes, right? Yeah. That same psychoactive, just blow, I mean, blow your mind high. Yeah, yeah, that's what he was talking about. He's like, I don't even know why anybody grows anything but that. He's like, I don't care if it's if it takes 10 and 500 to find one of them. That's You're, right. It's better than any weed you'll ever smoke he's like yeah. everybody's an idiot for not working with it and i i was like wow really but i mean it sounds like that this high truly does exist in cannabis in some form it's incredibly impressive and i say that as an understatement i mean yeah if, if you ever smoke it it will i i hope it's still right i hope somebody has a hybrid of it somewhere or something you know yeah or somebody resources the real deal because it legit comes from the edges of the panama Indian jungle yeah I mean, just right there. They don't go in too deep to have to get it. He told me a lot about it. But again, I'm old and I forget a lot of the details. But he had a lot of details about it. But just looking at the plant, it was crazy. First of all, it was red purple. I mean, oh, was all it, over it. Was it a, a purple yeah, flower red. plant? Bottoms of the leaves were purple. All the veins were purple. The stems were purple. The buds were purple. And the buds were dark purple, you know. But everything else was kind of a reddish purple. And those roots that would go back in the ground and start new plants. It was just crazy. That sounds a lot like the Dolores strain, too, that was around a long time ago. I think that um, – who talks about Dolores? Uh, Robert Clark, maybe? One of those guys they know about it. And it's a, it's an old uh, – I don't know if it's South American or Mexican hybrid, but um, similar. Very similar in how the, the looks, a lot of it. And it's I think it's in Big Sur Holy Week, the Dolores, like is a portion of it. So that's interesting. It would be interesting to see if we could find a way to find a strain similar to that. Well, gotcha. well, uh, well, a haze, a really good haze is very similar, very similar. So Tom was nailing it on the head with his haze. Maybe. Oh that's yeah, I mean, yeah. If you find a good haze, some are easier than others. It's like you know, yeah. We went through some. Uh, the first haze I remember, <laughs> it was like eighteen weeks flowering indoors. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Do you remember where it was sourced from, that one? No, that came from the surfers in Northern California. So those probably came, a good source. Those came from my buddy's surfer connection. They had those. But uh, that one was just even, and just the seeds from like any hybrid of that one, you know, mm -hmm. they, they never inbred it, but they hybridized it a lot. But like the Viet, like the Vietnam black, the jungle sativa. Yeah. It wa it walks all over anything you would cross it with like 90%. Yeah. Right? Something would have to be an IBL 10 or 15 or greater to even have a chance to play a little bit in the offspring recombination. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um so this is a personal question just for me. Did you keep seeds pure of the Vietnam black? Yes, I did. That's awesome. That that's what I just awesome. that's what I just did the soft back cross. I just released the uh, Black Forest F2, right? Yeah. In brackets, it says BX1, small BX1. Yeah. Because I didn't take it back to the original individual uh, Vietnam Black, but yeah. I took it back to a super superior male that had all the good signs on him. So I back crossed it to the line, not the individual. So gotcha. this generation of Black Forest that I just released, right? Mm -hmm. It's going to be wampin, wampin Vietnam black sativa. So you're, it's going to require not much looking through because, again, I've never seen a bad one of those. They're yeah. all they're all decent. But there are probably three out of ten, two out of ten mm -hmm. that are extreme. I mean, extreme. That is so cool. I Because I know most of the people have only been sourcing Vietnam black via, I can't remember who brought it to the scene, but I know Jojo passed it. Um, the, the Vietnam black that was in Willie Nelson and Billy goat also used one. But the fact that there's a whole nother separate Vietnam black line. 
from back in the day like that. Super interesting. And I think a lot of people are going to be interested to, to know that. Yeah, that came from my cousin in Vietnam. He sent those to me. That's that is sick. That is super sick. I always assumed it was the same one as the Billy Goat one. Knowing that just has me a thousand times more interested to see more of what Vietnam has to hold. Oh, God. Vietnamese. The, some of the, the Cambodians. There's just so many Southeast Asians I love. Actually, Bhutanese is a Southeast Asian, but they're far from haze like you know. They're Where did just, you notice that? That is a unique one. Bhutan was a closed kingdom for a long time. Yeah, yeah, I got those. I have a buddy of mine in China. Well, he's, he's kind of a buddy. We email back and forth about stuff. And he yeah. gets me stuff sent out of there. He's done it twice. Wow. And one, one of the things he sent me was this, uh, what was it? It was Bhutan. He called it Gold Bhutan. Anyway, it was it was right from the, uh, the, the, it was at the base of the Patet of the Tibetan mountain there, right? Mm -hmm. That's where it was harvested at. And it smelled just like fuel, right? Oh, wow. Like, like strong honey oil fuel. It was so acrid and gnarly. But we called it uh, butane gas, you know, yeah. butan gas because it smelled like fuel. Yeah. So we called it uh, butane gas, that, that line. Yeah. And that's what I crossed with the Hemingway. And then... I crossed that with the cherry bomb and made the cherry hemi. So That's the right. cherry hemi is a real cool collaboration of a lot of strange exotic shit. But there's a real wild side to that Bhutanese. If you piss off that Bhutanese or anything with Bhutanese in it, yeah, you, she's gonna hurt me and get pissed on you. Yeah, I would I would imagine so. It's a wild jungly place with there. I've seen their strains like because I um, in in Bhutan. I know that like there, there are wild cannabis growing at literally all over randomly and, and different little, even from house to house, you know, hundred meters apart might have different little cultivars or strains or whatever they go have going on, but they tend to be pretty jungly wild yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. So same, cool. same with South Africa from farm to farm or Jamaica from yeah. grower to grower, you know, you can have slight variations on stuff because of whatever their breeding practices are, you know? Yeah, and elevation, all of it, especially in some of those island places where elevation goes from sea floor to, you know, high super fast. More UV is always good up to a point. Yeah. Right. So you get too much UV, it's like if you grow plants in all day full sunshine and then you grow the a clone of that plant under all day laughing sunshine or dappled sunshine, mm -hmm. you're probably going to get a 10% bigger yield or 15% or bigger yield on your all day sunshine plant. Yeah. But that 10 or 15 percent is just pure vegetable fiber from the uv yeah it just makes everything bigger not better yeah it actually reduces the potency of the resin because it swells up everything so gnarly you know all the uv is just yep. promoting that vegetable growth so we used to take for our commercial interest we would grow full sun yeah but for our plants that we smoked we would either we build lathings over them, mm -hmm. or we kept them. We kept them positioned around trees so they would only get half a day of full sunshine and then half a day of dappled sunshine. That's really good advice too. Um, for some of these longer flowering indoor strains that that you have, would you recommend um, a different light hour time for indoors on some of your longer flowering strains? A different what? Light flowering time. You know how most people go to twelve hours as a standard. Do you ever recommend um, different flowering times for any of your strains? Well, if it comes from the the equator, mm -hmm. anywhere around the equator, what I will always do to it is during the second half of flowering, mm -hmm. I'll either drop my photo period to 12, 5, 11, 5, or 13, 11, you know? There you go, yeah. Or 11, 13, I mean, with, a, yeah, with yeah. 13 hours of darkness, right? Yeah. Because they grow pretty much year round with very slight photo period changes. Yeah. So sometimes i've had people have long flowering sativas all day many times they've told me it won't stop flowering <laughs> yeah 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 okay yeah. You, just, you just cut your cut your cut light, light hours. from 12 to 11 and that'll fix that in two weeks i remember i ran into a malawi this is the first time i ever ran into something like this and i had it in 12 hours of light and this is the first time i ever learned about light hours moving them or fluctuating them and i thought oh God, it was like three months in nothing no no flower formations and i i hit up bodhi i'm like bodhi what is going on what do i not know and he's like reduce your light hours dummy you know it's like reduce them watch it watch and then you know started reducing and we ended up moving down to eight 
and by the end of eight, it would finish. Eight hours of light, and it doesn't seem like it's enough. It's counterintuitive. You think it won't yield enough, but it's it was perfect for that velocity. It is, and you only really have to do it for the last few weeks, right? Yeah. Just so if you know about that, that's why I like sourcing geographical varieties and strains because I know a lot about different strains from different locales. Yeah. So if I know where it's from or where its constituents of the hybrid are from, I can assess all kinds of things right off the bat. I can assume a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. You know? So that yeah. helps me a lot. But if I'm just if somebody's offered me some seeds, I'm like, well, where is this from? Where where did the genetics come from? And they go, well, it's blue pups, blue boingo, and gorilla funk cookie mass. And yeah. you know, that tells me nothing. Zero. It tells you nothing, nothing about anything. anything about it. You don't even know if it's an Afghani. If it's if you don't know those specific names for those strains, you have no clue at yeah. all. No, nor do I really trust people who I don't know to tell me what's real. And they may, in fact, not no shade on them. They may believe yeah. it's true because yeah. somebody told them that they believe that it, and it wasn't true. Like I've heard, I've heard some good, fantastic stories that I just don't think are true. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There's a lot of people who are great people, just warm hearted people that will tell you information that isn't correct because they truly believe it to be true. And they trusted the person who gave it to them. And that person might be a great trustworthy person, but the person that, you know, just got it wrong once. We did you, have like, you, you have somebody who'll grow. I'm just going to use an example here of something. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, let's say a Cinderella 99, right? Yeah. They'll grow Cinderella 99 and they'll end up with, yeah, I don't know, let's say five females, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the females will be outstanding. Like in my C99 line now, if you want to look for something really outstanding, what you're looking for is an extra beefy female. Okay. I mean, she is vigorous and extra beefy to the max. She yields about 20% more than any other Cindy. Mm -hmm. And she is the most grape or the most uh, pineapple-y, delicious, resin so killer ever, okay? That's my favorite cut. Right? Mm -hmm. So let's say somebody grows them and, and they find that, that female, right? Yeah. Well, that's special, right? So they yeah. name her Griselda. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So then they decide, fuck, I need to breed this. So then what is the hybrid? X crossed with Griselda. Griselda. Not yeah. C99. No. So you lose a bunch of the strain lineage. History. You don't know. Yeah. It kills the anthropology of it all. And, and that's, yeah, that's what I kind of you have to, You know, I mean, I run it backwards in my head and go, oh, it's probably going to be like this. You know, there's a lot of stuff I can assess. But you tell me it's gooey cookie funk, and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, with with if we know that it's C99, we can go, okay, Jack Hera type. Uh, skunk one, haze, northern lights five. Okay, we can, you know, you can easily break it down. But yeah, once they start playing around past the baselines and it's just random names and they aren't really, there's not a lot you can get from that. And, and uh, to be honest, if I see something, um, a line that is like eight things in it, like some people will get all excited. The more hype strains are in it, the more excited they get. Because, but I, me, I walk away to sit the second I see too many because I'm like, I don't even know what I'm going to get from this, nor would I want to breed with that because it's going to be completely unpredictable. Holy and it would take years to learn the line, you know? Unpredictable is an understatement, right? Yeah. yeah. It just It's a totally it's different way. If, if you look on my site, you'll see that I do have polyhybrids for sure. Yeah. But I have a lot that are true two-way F1s, true three-way F1s, and true four-way F1s. Yes. Once yes. you have a five-way or above of an F1, then it starts to become a poly. But a lot of the ones these days are like 10. <laughs> yeah i remember least, if, if not more someone showed me the seed finder page for animal mints and i went and looked at like because you can do the strain map and see all the stuff in it listed it was like four pages long of of everything laid out because it's just polyhybrid 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 cookies trying right. bx right and it all it all ends up being og kush in the end but none of that really matters because they've crammed og kush into itself and all of its expressions 90 times over you know, right. And, you know, I like to keep everything separate, too. I like to know when I'm not double dipping in some gene pool. So if I if I have a, a C99 cross with an OG Kush and a C99 cross with a metal haze. OK, mm -hmm. I have those two strains now. Oh, I did it again. C99, 
Metal Haze, C99. That's what I was going to say. You see what happens when you have resin on your brain? <laughs> I do. I'm seeing my future right here. You are. For me. You are. Because <laughs> I was such a, such a forgetful person. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now I remember. Okay. All right, so if you have those two those two varieties, those two hybrids, mm -hmm. right? Now you smoke one. Oh yeah, this is really good. Oh, it gets me high. Then you go to smoke the other one. You go, yeah, that's pretty good. Well, it could be every bit as good as the first one, but you've already built up some tolerance to the C99 in the first one. Yeah. So the second C99 hybrid is going to be a little less impressive to you. Yeah. So when I'm testing things. Or sampling them and want to know really more about them. I got to make sure that I'm not cross cross encountering some things in two different ones because then I have to adjust that into my whole deal. Yeah, that's not an obvious thing to think of either. Like uh, building tolerance to a specific strain or type when you're doing testing. So, would you recommend like maybe the next day, the following day, maybe smoking one in the morning and one at night, and vice versa the next day? Or, or you up. can or you can clean your palate if you've got. If you've got a couple of hybrids that have a common P1, mm -hmm. right, then you could just clean your palate in between, right? Yeah. You could, you could sample one, check it out, and then go for something way out of totally the different. way out of the bandwidth. Yeah. Then come back to the second one and then sample it. I do that a lot of times. That works really good for me. That makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Give your give your receptors time to change a little bit. Yeah, one of my favorites to clean my palate with is Congo, right? Yeah, the, why, why is that? The Cindy Congo is super, well, because it's one of those, you know, you know, the strains that you could be smoking different weed all day. You can be kind of baked, you know, hanging around it. And then you smoke that weed where you take a few hits and it just wipes out all the rest of anything you've ever smoked and completely yes. just takes over with a new high. Mm -hmm. That's Congo. Yeah, the breakthrough highs. I always call those breakthrough highs because it's breakthrough Congo. everything else. It just stomps out any kind of mild effects. <laughs> what kind of smells come out of the Congo that you work with? They are real, uh, like, kind of rotten meat with, uh, like, a sickening sweet background. Interesting. It's uh, it's acrid, but it's not fuely. You know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. like, it's like rotting meat is the best way I could do it. It's sweet. But in a kind of a sickeningly sweet way, kind of like the Matanuska Thunderfuck. It's weird that they smell a lot alike, but they do. I wonder. I mean, does it smell like a dead body? Maybe because sweet. Like I remember. It, yeah, I yeah, yeah. But yeah, but you have yeah. to imagine what I mean when I say that there's a sweet component to it. It's not like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's this... like it's like ooh, but it's strangely compelling. <laughs> Someone I knew that worked in a in a funeral home always described the death and, and they described this to me before I smelled it because I, I would do I would help them in the in the funeral home. But um, they said bodies, dead bodies smell like sweet shit, sweet rotting meat. It's, there's a sweetness to it, though. That's really freaking weird. There is, yeah. it's, like, it's sort of like sugar cookies. In yeah. A weird oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. So it's almost. Wow. That would be a really weird but attractive smell. I mean, I've smelled. Body odor smells in um, cannabis, like, uh, what was it, Bodie's, he had a, a strain called Hippie Slayer 33, I think, and it smelled like straight B.O., but it, it tasted, it smelled yummy, like I wanted to eat it, like, why would you want to eat human B.O., but I did. I'm I with you, I'm with you, the metal haze was pure cat piss, I mean, yeah. just, just pissy pit, you would think, if you opened a bag of that, anyone who walked in would think, whoa, did the cat just pee in here? Yeah. It was pure piss, but, again strangely attractive and compelling strangely attractive yeah do you still keep that metal haze cut no i lost the metal haze cut to police rest but, in uh, peace metal haze fucking police fucking pigs they, they always get them i mean that cut was really special i got to work with it a few times and i it reminded me of a um maybe a more in the structure nl skunk one dominant because it wasn't super 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 like lanky haze but it had a right. good structure to it there right it did structure, good bud structure and stuff that was such a cool line man that was such I a loved cool it. well the reason the re one of the main reasons i crossed it to the uh iron cindy mm -hmm. was to preserve it to some extent because they're very similar yeah right they're very yeah similar. yeah yeah definitely it's that skunk one or like five haze combo that you can see in both of them well, I could, yeah, because I did it to make the Iron Cindy 
I combined the metal haze and the C99 because the C99 is like a little metal haze kind of mm-hmm. a faster uh, C99 is yeah. really unique. I really love it. I mean, it has a kind of a, it's like a poor man's haze. Mm, definitely. It has a lot of hazy sativa qualities to it. Not all, but a surprising amount for a eight or nine week plant, you know? I think that's why C99, C99 gained such popularity because people want that type of high in the same kind of flowering time they could get from some of these Afghanis. And it's one of the few lines other than like High and Lonesome's Appalachia that I've found that really captured the ability to capture a sativa in a short flowering time like that. It's like C99 is the only one I've ever seen that did it. That's why I grabbed it up so fast. I was like, oh, my God, this is this is really like a fast sativa with some definite longer sativa flowering qualities. Yeah, you know? yeah, especially I, in the high. I, I love the C99. I think she's fantastic, especially now that I found that Buku grapefruit mama. Yeah, no kidding. I see. I'm a sucker for that pineapple. All right, not grapefruit. I'm sorry, pineapple. Oh yeah, the pineapple one. Man, that terpinaline, that 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 what you would refer to as like cat pissy smell, but like mixed with the pineapple makes the flavor translate so well. Like it actually tastes like pineapple. So sharp citrus pineapple. Sharp so citrus good. pineapple, right? Yeah, it would it would it would be so hard for someone to intentionally make that again from scratch. I think. It is one of the most pineapple-y things there are in cannabis. Super it, cool. It really, really is pineapple. I mean, especially with a little cure on it. Two weeks of a cure, and you open the jar, and it's like, damn. Yeah. Yeah, that's one that I, I, I do miss a lot, and I've actually been trying to look for it. I think CSI Humboldt might have grabbed it recently, so hopefully that, that one's going to come back in rotation soon. Now, you have you, a book you, coming out soon, you, yeah? You can, always, you can always get the pineapple. I mean... I'm not sure. I don't know what the ratios are, Mm -hmm. the percentages of chance that she pops up. But I did find her within uh, probably 15 females. Okay. I found one. Mm -hmm. And I've had friends of mine that have found them. So they're not super hard to find. No, no, they're in there. Definitely. They're probably one. Well, probably one in eight, maybe one in 12, something like that. So if, if, if people are interested, do you still carry that line in seed form and sell it on your site? Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Do you oh, still- Oh, yeah, I preserve, the, C- I preserve the C99. They're still like the F5s yeah. that, that I have made. And what happened was last time I made them, I made a shitload. Mm-hmm. And I put most of them in deep freeze cryo. Good, right? good. Yeah. So now I just tap from a smaller source. Once they run out, I bust into the deep freeze cryo, bring a bunch out and do it again. It's that way it. it can stay the same. I don't have to keep inbreeding them and inbreeding them. And you don't have to keep yanking them in and out of the cryo constantly every time you want to take out a pack and fluctuate. Right, them. right. Yeah. And I love this. I love a couple of the phenos, but the pineapple beast is my favorite. And I'll always want to be able to get her. So I didn't want to risk it on the off chance that because sometimes it's like with the skunk, man. Sometimes it's just cannabis mother nature just goes ha 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 you yeah know? there's just nothing you could do you try to combine what you think is going to work in a certain way and it comes out almost opposite yeah i can't yeah. tell you now twice now i've combined roadkill skunk male with road skill kill skunk female mm-hmm. and i get all the same spread that i would have if i would have pretty much crossed anything any other two yeah you know it always comes out spreading the spread i can't get to isolate it down what i what I just did recently for uh, just because that pisses me off. Yeah, yeah. Is as I took uh, the Vietnam black jungle sativa uh-huh. since, since I had the male flowering, right? Yeah. And I had a roadkill skunk candy. Uh-huh. It was only a little clone, right? I had a little clone. I was like, yeah, yeah. Okay. I popped it in the flowering tent, you know? Yeah. And it made a flower and it only ended up about this big, but it got pollinated with that gnarly. You've never smelled the V black before. Let me tell you, it's it's not like anything else ever I've smelled in my life. It's, it's sort of like Nag Champa incense. Yeah. yeah. And it's real sharp. And, oh, it's just god awful, exotic and delicious. But I mean, so I crossed it with that, right? It's a yeah. tart, sharp, acrid terpene profile, right? Yeah. So I brought the the roadkill skunk up against it. Now I'm going to end up with a long flowering son of a bitch. It's going to be 12 weeks at least. Yeah. But if I 
grow these out and I get a high percentage of roadkill skunks, you can bet I'll be weeding them down to shorter flowering and be able to keep that roadkill skunk because I'm sure that V black will rule dominant in many of the things, especially the turp combo, right? Yeah, yeah. I should be able to, in theory, inbreed these yes. with the right combo and get all roadkill skunk. They might be 11 weeks, they might be 10 weeks, but I should be able to do it because I can't I can't get my skunk line to come all roadkill. It just it won't I've tried three different ways and I always get the same spread no matter what I do. I've so, tried two different ways with a few different lines and it is very hard especially once the bud is dry to lock in that smell. Once the bud dries it's like pff, that smell is gone. It, sometimes it that is the case. Yeah. Sometimes it just, you know, it depends on a lot of things. It's like what I do now, more recently, only for the last, I don't know, three years, maybe four years or so, is I used to never dry my weed too dry because I like to smoke it when it has just a skosh of moisture still in it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's much, much smoother. Absolutely. You smoke super, super dry weed, it's a little hot, right? Yeah, man. So I always like my weed like that. So it's hard to store weed like that without consistently burping it constantly exactly. Exactly. Or, else, or else it loses the smells faster right yeah so what what i do now is oh and this works good buddy i take and i mummify it right i mean i dry it so fucking bad you touch it it'll just crumble <laughs> okay that's how, that's how dry i dry it yeah and i very carefully put it in big jars and put it in a big insulated cooler and i store it right mm -hmm. Now, when I want to hit that weed or check it out or smoke it or whatever, I just open the jar up. My mm -hmm. humidity around here is usually around 50%, which is fine. 50, yeah. 60%, that's fine. And I take some very carefully out of the jar. I set it in an open bowl, close the jar, put it back. And then I let it just set out in my room for about oh, a few hours usually. Mm -hmm. Check the moisture level because fast it'll start soaking that up. Oh, it'll I bet. Start that's right. Up the moisture from there, right? Yeah. And then it gets to that perfect consistency within several hours. Sometimes it takes overnight. It depends if the humidity is low. Yeah. But uh, but by the next day or within a few hours, boom, you not only have the perfect moisture level in your buds, but the smells just come out with a vengeance then. Oh, right? Because it all yeah. starts processing again. Yeah. Once you mummified it, you've stopped it. Yeah. You've stopped everything it's doing. There's no moisture in there, right? Yeah. So, so it preserves your buds for a super long time. So I take them all, I put them in all smaller containers, like like either pint jars or what are they, quart jars. Yeah. I save them all in that so that I never have to bust one open and keep opening it. You know, that way I can burn through one in a relatively short amount of time. Absolutely. Not have to keep opening it and close it, having more moisture get in there. Yeah, constantly had that fluctuation. Good. I opened up some Blue Rhino 1947 a few days ago. Mm -hmm. That was five years old. It's been in storage for five years. I did that to it. <laughs> five oh, years? And it wasn't frozen or anything? It, it, perfect. That's no, crazy. no. It was just now. Understand, I store them in a big, gnarly, insulated cooler. Okay. This cooler is in a place that is pretty cool, never gets really warm. Gotcha. gotcha. So the real key to the long-term storage is having your degree variance be very small in any 24 hour period, right? That makes you sense. You only want that to change like a degree or two max. Max, right? yeah. And then that will store it as long as it's cool for a super long time all by itself. So mine stays like that in the cooler. Five years, buddy, five years. I broke That's it out, let the, let the moisture absorb it. I squeezed it and went, mama! <laughs> <laughs> you know who else is, is blown my mind is Bodie. He has like this this barn with um, buds hanging in it and for years you can have buds in here and and just of all different land races and stuff people want to pick it off but because santa cruz's humidity is so perfect it's just like a humidor for bud it lasts years it's crazy absolutely crazy that is nice you know yeah. if you've got like here it's really a lot of times here in oregon it's too wet to really yeah. i mean I can pop them in the room since I don't trim the plant at harvest now. I just take the whole plant, right? Yeah, yeah. All the, all the big leaves will come down and protect most of the buds from the light. Yep. But sometimes, man, I just have to hang them in the grow room to let them dry, you know? Mm -hmm. And they're not in any direct light, but no, there's sure. a lot of reflected light, which is not my favorite. But I sometimes have to do it because my humidity is 90% plus for a week. Yeah. You know? 
I mean, and I can't dry anything like that. If I put it in the jars, I'll be mold city fast. Oh yeah, yeah. Super. Oh, but my, my girl, who I have, uh, I have uh, Kai Fon, this tool of hers. Mm -hmm. She had a uh, a dehydrator, right? Uh huh. There you go. If it's Did too much to dry, it with weed? right when I pull them down, I take them all in little buds. I stack them all in that dehydrator. I let that fucker roll for about an hour mm -hmm. to get mummy dry. And yeah, very carefully put them in the jars and put them away, and that works like a champ. But during the summer, I don't need it. I can, I can mummy dry them just hanging them out yeah. in the closet, you know. Yeah. So you have a new book coming out. Um, we we have the TLO uh, version one and two, correct? Yes. Is this the V three or is this a whole new book? Whole new book. What do we got? Tell us oh, about man, it. Oh man, it's. Uh, I've leaned away from the whole tease thing right okay. i don't like teas anymore all right what I, what I like is a perpetual tea i call it the churn right okay it's a constant addition to your water that you back off when it's near harvest the whole book will explain it but it is the book and bomb right okay that's how i keep i adjust my water and uh i give in the new book there's like i don't know probably 10 soil recipes for any situation no matter what you can get and what you can't get with tons of options for what you can sub in. That was a point of problem for some people where they would yeah. not be able to get something in the original recipes and they would sub in something else oh, that's yeah. not good. Yeah. Right? Or or they would just leave it out completely. And with some things you can leave out, it's no big deal. But with other things, that's not the case, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So what but else yeah, you got so, in it? What are we so it's all these new soil recipes. It's all the new dynamics around growing in general. It shows new micro pond style, right? Mm -hmm. Which is essentially using the catch trays as little micro ponds. Yeah, right? yeah. Where the water sits in for a while, you have some alfalfa and whatnot in there. All the micro life grows and then gets sucked back into the plant and everything is beautiful. That method works like unbelievably good. I'll have to check that out. I've never heard that. Oh, it's so kick-ass, man. It's so easy. It's like, it's like top dressing, but it's uh -huh. bottom dressing. But it's like top dressing that works much faster, right? It's that like you get really results cool. within within days. You can see the effects of what you've done. And so that's a that's a new component to the book. What else are you adding in? What else are we covering? Oh my God, I've got so many new things about lighting and sprouting and vegging and some detailed information about the lighting and photo periods, like you said, how to do sprouts, clones. Uh, all keeping with the TLO methodology, you know. Yeah. I have I have an extensive troubleshooting section that I believe will handle any freaking problem anybody can have. That's killer. That I'm pretty killer. sure because I've seen with well, the first two books, I've seen a, a lot of specific issues people have. Not yeah. that it's their own fault. It's usually because of they can't source something, you know, along those lines. Yeah. Well, or I, they I, or they use something that's not what I said to use, like a couple of people have really boned themselves using kelp extract to mix with their soil mix instead of kelp meal. Ah, yep, that will do it. And that's a synthetic process to make the extract, right? With the kelp? No, 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 no. Kelp extract is, it's all now, it's fine. Okay. It's just highly Higher. concentrated. Yeah, obviously. Highly concentrated. Okay. Yeah, you, you start adding four cups of that to your soil, you're done. <laughs> Just gonna cook it. Pot potassium overdose is one of the ugliest, most horrible ways to lose your plants. Because yeah, it is. It is an ugly, ugly death. <laughs> so now I know people are going to kick my ass if I don't ask you about your roadkill skunk. You mentioned it briefly. Where did you source it? Uh, what, what was it like? Can you describe it a little bit? Okay. Long ago in Northern California, I made lots of friends. Yeah. When I went to the... Uh, uh, what was the cup? The Emerald Cup in 2013. Yeah. I uh, got a hold of an old friend of mine in Willits that I knew had the skunk. I knew he was a gatekeeper of it. I knew yeah. he had. So he was, you know, paranoid, skeptical. He kept calling me Worldwide Rev. <laughs> Why is that? We, you know, he just didn't dig the fact that I was uh, so out of hiding. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. You know, so... So there was that aspect. So anyway, I worked on him for a while, about six months, and we finally made a deal. Mm -hmm. I would trade him some of my Mohawken for mm -hmm. some of his skunk, right? So 
we finally got together and he finally did it. And he assured me that he hadn't bastardized it. He'd all, it was the original skunk line, which I remember when it was first, before it was skunk, it was called Red Russian, right? Red Russian, okay. That's what it was before everybody realized how skunky it was and the rest there, is history. Was there a Russian river up there in North Cal? Is yeah, that that's where that's part of the why it was named that. Yeah, it was uh, okay. right off the Russian River. And uh and it was very red. Yeah. Makes sense. So uh so anyway, so it's always had from seeds from it, it's always had kind of a spread. There's mm -hmm. always some sweeter, some like body odor, stinky feet ones. Mm -hmm. And then there's like really skunky, roadkill skunky ones. There's pissier ones. There's even some with a little bit of a sweet component to them. Although those were very rare. Yeah. With this plant, I've, I've, I've grown some of these out several times now. And I get, I get a nice spread. I get roadkill pretty often. Yeah. I would say one in eight maybe. Yeah. But, but I don't have enough of a, numbers of those spreads really say that for sure yet yeah to so make it I've consistent got, i've gotten it about one and eight so far from three runs right yeah so the road kills the problem with the skunk is that there's no way to tell it's road kill until two weeks before harvest yeah i know of no way yeah right because the yeah, there's smells no indicator stay, nothing smells the all the turpins stay stay changing oh i'm gonna have to plug this in that's all right I'm running a low battery. Hang on. Right. We'll keep it going. All right. Let me see if I can do this and not screw things up. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be cool. Oh, I'm a techno wizard. It'll be fine. <laughs> Don't worry. I got this handle. <laughs> Come on, baby. <laughs> Okay, how's my audio? Perfect. All right. Because sometimes when you plug it in, the audio goes to hell. Yeah, no, you're good. So let's talk about the morphology of this skunk. Was it a, a pure Afghani? Was it a hybrid? What, what did you see from it? I've heard three what I consider to be legit stories from people I consider to be trustworthy. Yeah. So I'm not really sure what it is. Yeah. I uh, The one consistency that I have heard a lot is that it was a South American Cross mm -hmm. to the original indica that came to Northern California. Okay. There, there was that kind, remember, with mm -hmm. the leafy florets? Yes. Yeah. Right. That was, that, was all, yeah. that was all over suddenly. Everybody had it, right? That yeah. indica. And it was real purple and real gnarly. But uh, somebody, now the best I know is that was crossed with a South American. Okay. That's what, that's what originally brought the skunk line, which was when it was red Russian, it was, and even skunk, it was, very resistant to things like mold and powdery mildew. It didn't have a problem with any of that stuff. And uh, as it now that it's an IBL, I don't know, 13 or yeah. 15 or 20. Jeez. Now it's got some of those standard weaknesses to go with it. It's not so, not so resistant to everything anymore, but it's still pretty much the plant I remember, you know, I mean, granted that was a long time ago and I am Mr. Magoo. Yeah. But, from what I remember, it, I would uh, my best my best estimate and feeling is that he did give me the true one that he has inbred himself. Yeah. But like I said, the skunk has a thing where it just won't it won't go where you think it will go when you breed it. It won't. Yeah. yeah. It'll, it'll just do its standard. It'll just whip out bandwidths of the different terps, the different morphologies. You know, all of the morphologies are close. The yeah. terps are terps are wide ranging. You know. There's, there's I, the two killers are the body odor, stinky feet, and the skunk. Yeah. They are soup. Now, there's another one that I remember that is also in these, a piney one, right? Yeah, people love pine. Super pine resin. I mean, really sharp. It's almost skunk. Right? Yeah. But it's pine resin. But pine, yeah. yeah. And those are probably the most potent in the bunch. So do you do you notice any intersex traits specifically in that line or any of the skunky stuff? Do you ever notice that? Like, for example, um, so a lot of the 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 lines that we're seeing that have a lot of the skunky traits, whether it's me or CSI, we've been doing a lot of skunk stuff. Almost all of them are freaking full intersex. Every time we run into that same terpene profile, a lot of the times it comes with intersex traits. Heavy. I don't, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by intersex. Like traits. herming, herming. Oh, oh. No, no, there, no, no, there's no, there's my skunk is sexually healthy, but 
that's good to know. That would not surprise me because when the skunk came out, of course, you had to have it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. You had to, you had to have it. Yeah. So everybody had it. And while I was associated with some pretty damn decent breeders who were teaching me stuff. Yeah. That wasn't the same for everyone, right? Yeah. Oh, of course. Uh, and so everybody and their mom was breeding it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just everybody did. So tons of it, tons of the seeds of skunk yes. flooded the market. But, you know, you got people who just, uh, they just can't uh, seem to put in the work it takes to make sure that you're not uh, blowing Hermes or, you know. Any of it. Testing yeah. their minds, seeing what you've made, any of it. Yeah, that's a I lost mean, art. Shit, I do. I do the most deep inspection on unknown plants. If I have anything that I don't, that I'm not already totally familiar with, then I'm in there with my 30 times super light magnifying glass every day. While yeah. flying. You know, I'm looking close. I'm seeing because I can recognize when Hermes are about to happen be right before they do. You know, there's a little mutant growth that occurs down yep. at the axial intersects. Mm -hmm. You can see it's like a mutant growth, a mutant leaf growth kind yeah. of. Yeah, because it's not. It, 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 it's different than how a female typically grows when you can see that. Yeah, sort of like it's trying to reveg a little. Mm -hmm. So, I for the viewers watching this, I want I want people to take note because I, I often talk about like different things you learn only through experience and breeding, and one of those, if you'll notice, when when I'm sitting here talking with my friend the Rev, he's talking about you know I know this line. It's, it's because I know the line. I know what I can see from it. And it for someone who isn't super experienced running a bunch of different lines, not only a bunch of different lines, but a bunch of the different baselines, meaning Northern Lights, Skunk One, Haze, a lot of these land races, it's hard to truly understand until you run them what it is when you can truly start predicting. And that's what breeding is. When you're able to predict, you know, uh, to, to run your lines and then to see it in action and to realize, okay, I was either right or wrong at this and make the next move. That's what, that's all breeding is. And, and when you get to this point in your career, when you've been breeding 40, you know, 30 years, a lot of this stuff comes secondhand and, it, and a lot of it becomes a natural instinct as you're going through these, these things. And there's, there's even stuff you're telling me about different traits of the, of the leaf hairs on the cotyledons and stuff like that. I have never even thought of, and I, I spend all of my time looking at the plants, you know, just, constantly observing and, and that's how you learn is constantly observing you don't want to just let your plants you know leave them in a room let it auto run for a week or whatever if, if you're really into it learn your plants at every freaking stage that's how you know and uh rev's a great example of that everything you've been saying about that just reinforces that 100 percent. right and it's like when i was telling you about my little hash trick earlier it's like if you are a, a breeder who doesn't really know your shit yet and you're dealing with lines that you're not really familiar with yet, the easiest way to do it is to pick, let's say, four of the strongest, best, vigorous females, right? Yeah. Grab a couple of the strongest, biggest, best males, throw them all in and let them breed. Now, when they're about two weeks from finishing, just go over them all with a magnifying glass. See who has the most resin. Get a grip on them. Smell them. You'll know the smells by then, right? Yep. Everything will be less because they'll be full of seeds, but you can take that into consideration. You, you yeah. can Then go in and check them out. Then you get a really good idea of what you're dealing with, who's better than who, who's likely to be the king, who sucks, right? Yeah. You can tell yeah. at that point. Now you just recycle the plants that suck or make hash or do whatever you want, right? Exactly. But I always make hash from those plants that turn out good. That I don't know anything about, but they're killer. Yeah, I'll make cash from so that I can further dissect the exact resin profile relating to the high type itself, which is, which is what I cherish over everything else because some weed just it makes me aggro. Train wreck yeah. do that. Uh, you know, there's different hash plants that can do that for me. The, the, the really super fast flowering plants, the ones that flower in like six or seven weeks. Yeah, yeah. Those all have the exact same quality for me of what I call agro weed, right? Yeah. It's like I smoke them. I get really high, really baked. I'm all, whoa, this is, it doesn't last long. It only lasts like an hour or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Then you come out of it, and, man, I'm like, fuck. I just have <laughs> a shitty mood. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. I just, I don't like that. Yeah, no, that's so not I hate those either. super fast flowering ones, man. I just do. Do you think it's maybe like it just hasn't had enough time for the resin glands to mature and in, in different oils, obviously, because they're Afghanis, they'll have different oils than, than 
these longer flowering sativas, but maybe that's what has something to do with the high, just not enough time. Well, certainly it has to do with, uh, you know, the type of high, generally speaking. Sure. You, know, you have that to high I just described, that super up, super fast, really fucked up, and then you're down there. Ah, I hate that. Yeah. Yeah, that high just bugs me. But on a longer flowering sativas, you have much more different kinds of highs. Yeah. A lot of them come across much different. Some are very evil. Some are very happy. So, you know, some are very, you can't read a book because you have to keep rereading the first paragraph a hundred times. That's my life. <laughs> right? you know, some are just like that. So yeah. I like to get a grip on those smaller assets of it. I agree with you. You accident, you absolutely, I think it's impossible to get a sativa 10 week plus high from anything that's below seven weeks. Yeah. No, you know, I, I could believe you could awesome. do it in eight. Mm -hmm. I could believe that. Yeah. But I've never really seen, the closest thing I've ever seen is a Cindy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But so it would be rare, but yeah, in order to get the kind of highs I really like, and I really look for, it's gotta be a 10 weeker, nine yeah. week, nine week exceptions. I've seen twice in my life. Almost every single breeder, or someone I would consider a connoisseur weed that, that has the experience has smoked a lot of different strains like and, and knows what they've been smoking. They all tend to lean to that 10 to 11 week high. Everybody seems to kind of, as we get older, I think also our bodies mature, the chemicals in our brains change. And I think we all tend to just kind of navigate to that certain kind of high type in the end. It's really, really bizarre, but I've noticed it. It's the best of both worlds. It's really where the yeah. intersections meet. You can, it can go either way that way. Yeah. You can find anything you like. Plus, at 10 weeks, you generally speaking, almost always, have much longer legs, right? Yeah, yeah. The legs will be much longer. And if you get that six, that V, that v black I'm telling you about, mm -hmm. not only does that take 20 minutes to set in. Oh, I bet, yeah. 20 minutes. That's wild. It's going to be 20 minutes before you're like, holy shit. Before the ride like, truly starts? Yeah. All right. Yeah. But then you're going to stay exactly that high. There's no wobbling. <laughs> it's going to be like a freight train. It's going to go yeah. up slow. And then, man, you're not going to get off of that for maybe five hours. That's crazy. It'll cook you all day long. That is awesome. It is. It's one of my favorites for going, you know, out on bike rides or something, you know. Oh, I bet. I love that super long flower and sativa tie. B black, anything like that. The metal haze was killer for that. The chunky cherry tie. Oh, oh yes. So what's what's some of the current work you're working on? What is what's some stuff you're really excited about right now? Right now, I'm just kind of in a blurb where I'm just bringing up some stuff to look at. Yeah. I just I just switched over my lights for winter, so I'm all back to my eye blue 6500 Kelvin metal halide lamps. Yeah. So once I once I get those in. I have to do a little adjusting to my environment to make sure I can run everything right because they're freaking hot, right? Yeah, yeah. And I run tents. So yeah. So anyway, I'm dialing that all in. So what I thought I would do is pop up a few. I've got uh, right now just my ones to have a look at right now that yeah. I have up are some Afghani orange that's so old. I'm not sure if it's a hybrid of Afghani orange or something else. And I'm not sure who gave it to me, but I had it in my four star can. Oh, wow. So, but, but it's so old that the label wore off, and all I can read is Afghani Orange was part of it. So I had to see what those were. Yeah. yeah. And they look they look cool. They look good. And then, of course, the G13 Haze, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I ended up, I planted like six. I still got two more seeds. Yeah. I planted six. I got four to come up. Two died just, you know how they are with super, super old seeds. Yeah. Two just kind of came up and went, eh, no. Yep. And then the other two, which are a male and a female, and you know, I don't want to yeah. jinx myself or anything, but they both look really good. Yeah. So I'm testing though now. I just popped that G13 of flowering. Oh, you bet I did. Oh, that's awesome. That I cool. need to be I need to be looking at that, right? Yeah. And then on the uh in the other 10, I started up some cherry thunderfuck. Oh, nice. And some uh Cindy Black, which okay. with the scum. Yeah. Black? yeah. Black? Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So it, so with my so the, here's what, why because in my head, if my Vietnam black skunk doesn't work out how I think, yeah, then I'm gonna try the Cindy black skunk and see if I can lock in those fucking skunk turbines because something'll do it eventually. Something will do it. 
I yeah. just have to find a gene that goes in there and knocks them all cattywampus and gets them to line up more uniform for me. Yeah, or a gene that somehow in one strain makes that link trait to the skunk smell have something, you know what I mean? Like a link trait that's good with it and brings it out. Something it that locks it in. Something that'll just stick right to it and make it so I can recognize when it's there. Exactly. Something visual, a visual marker. Visual it. early on, a, a, a marker expression is what I call them. And that would be super nice to have because with the skunks at present, the, pheno, the morphology is, you know, pretty random. They're not, they don't have a wide range, but there's yeah. a lot of different ones. It's not an indicator. And yeah. nothing is locked to the roadkill. And as far as any patterns, leaf patterns, petiole patterns, root size, root density, root pat, I cannot find anything <laughs> that crazy. is only visible with the roadkill skunk, right? Yeah. Nothing. So I'm like, that pisses me off because as much as I don't mind flowering some plants, yeah, I, I, I am used to, and I do like knowing early, at least having a grip on what I'm dealing with, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it, I mean, as a breeder and as someone who has goals in their breeding, that's like, that's the main part. It's never yeah, seen enough mean, to I, know. If I have to take up 10, if I have to flower 10 females to find my, my roadkill skunk every time, well, that's not how I do things. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a, it's a bit. It's a I bit, mean, the whole right. idea of becoming better and getting to know what you're doing is to be able to take short pets, right? Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's that's the whole point of the experience. Yeah. yeah. As I, I mean, if you if you don't know anything about breeding, you can probably do really well if you're just willing to do the work, flower out all the plants first, yep. harvest them all, sample them all, and then bring have save clones, and then just breed with those. And you'll probably have learned more than any most other breeders out there in just that one experience by going through, taking good notes, smoking everything, and testing. You'll you'll be more advanced than ninety nine percent of seed makers, I should say, out there. That I agree. There. I yeah. agree. And I t I tell people a million times. You know, you're going to start out. It's going to seem like a lot. Of, you know, you'll be taking a lot of notes. You'll be able to, but pretty soon you're going to start to know a lot of things just intuitively from what yes. you see. You know, it's you know it, it becomes much easier especially like i said with mine that i'm familiar with you know i can tell when they're a month old a lot of things i need to know right then and you that's know, a cool I part of no i know which expressions are linked i know which markers i'm looking for i know which markers equal something i don't want you know yeah and that's a cool thing about keeping your little galapagos island of, of gene pool it really is because you've had all this time to learn these specific strains to learn how they breed and um when I tell people to know your breeder, this is what I'm talking about. You should be able to have a competent conversation with your breeder about their lines, about the history of their lines. And if they're passionate breeders, if this is what they love, you should be able to have a conversation like this. And, and, and this has been an exceptional, exceptional conversation with you. Is there anything else you want to get in and plug or talk? Pardon me now? Is there anything else you want to get in before the end of the show and plug or... Well, let's see. With the new book, I should be able, I should be submitting the manuscript around, I'm thinking, first half of December. Okay. So that should be able to put it in print by the spring, I think. That's awesome. So that would be super cool if you want to get a copy of that. I mean, with this book, I, you know, in the first two books, one of the first things I start out by saying is, this is not a grow book. This is not to teach you how to grow weed. Yes. Yes. Right. This is assuming you already know how to grow weed and you want to grow it all naturally. And you want to grow it better. Yeah. That, yeah. So but now in this book, I was able to not only organize it better. So after you read it, as you're growing, you can go, wait a minute. What was it? You can actually find what you're looking for because yeah. I've kept it all very isolated to chapters now. Good. So you can go and look and reference it, which is something the first two were lacking because you know, I'm kind of a bozo. I've never written a book before. Oh, it's hard, man. Like, whoa! I can't even imagine where you'd it's start. It's harder and, than you think it's going to be, too, you know? together, yeah. And the saddest part, the saddest part, is that the easiest part is actually writing the book. Yeah. Right? It's Definitely the right. millions and millions of times you have to go back through it and rewrite, recheck, update everything, and get, make sure everything's, you know, you on track. Because... With TLO, I mean, I'm learning things, new things a couple times a month. I learn, whoa, I, I learn something new, you know, because I try new stuff all the time. Well, you're a pioneer of TLO. So I, I, is, I uh, think, yes. yeah, 
And so, so, you know, I'll be in the book. Like I was halfway through the book and I discovered something and I was like, Oh shit. So that's like that. Huh? I go, Oh, so now I have to go through the whole book, read it front to halfway and correct every reference I've made. That's relative to that. And yeah. any spinoff references that are relative to that. Yeah. So it becomes a lot of tedious work, but now it's, I'm in my favorite part now. I love this part. This is the home run right here. This is this is where I'm just rolling through it from front to back. I'm correcting punctuation, adding photos, just making sure everything is, you know, my paragraphs are good. My punctuation is good. I've said clearly what I want to say, yada, yada. So this is the fun times. This is all fun work now. Do you have to do all the formatting when writing your books and like where the pictures go and formatting of the text and everything? Or does someone else do that? I give a general format location. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Like a lot of times, I'll, you know, when I'm talking about something and I'm showing a picture reference to it. Yeah. Yeah. In the manuscript, I note the photo at that point. Yeah. You know, so that they know I want it to be somewhere real close to that statement. Gotcha. Okay. You know? So, so yeah, that works out good, but they're, they're pretty good about just keeping it my way. You know, they, they try to work out things. What I do is I, I give them like a bunch of extra like bud shots that yeah. are just, I don't have any place for them. I just put them in an extra folder for them. And I go, if you need to make space to, you know, say, so my paragraphs are closer to my pictures I put in there, just use one of these bud shots to even it all out, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so that works out good for both of us. Shout out to Green Candy Press. They're, they're my favorite cannabis publisher. They publish your books. Um, they did the, the Strain, uh, Cannabis Indica and Cannabis Sativa volumes. Yeah. Back in the day. And the Cannabis Grow Guide. And yep. They do a lot of stuff like that. I mean, they've always... They've always done me right. They've always treated me right. They've always done what they said. And when they said they'd do it, they do it. And yeah. uh, I, I first got hooked up with them through John over at Skunk, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, he was buddies with Andrew over at Green Candy. So I just uh, hooked up with Andrew and I, and I couldn't be happier, man. He's a great guy. Everybody who works there is great. It's it's a lot of, it's it's good working with those people, you know? Yeah, I met them through you. And they, when I worked with them in the cannabis indica and sativa stuff, they were fascinating. I mean, they were just so kind and generous. And if I ever work with a book publisher, that's going to be the number one one I go through because it's just they're they're great people. So I want to sure give them a plug. Super easy to work with. And, you know, like he knows that I've been uh, I've been struggling with trying to finish the book. You know, I just got my last hit from COVID not too long ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, shit, it spun me hard. I didn't yeah. even get, I just got like flu from the first one, you know, mm -hmm. but this one, man, this last one, and it gave me kind of long COVID. I'm like extra fuzzy and sleepy. All right. Let's cover, um, let's go over the, the website before we're done. Kingdomorganicseeds.com. Can you talk about it? Okay. Yeah. So something, when you go to Kingdom Organic Seeds, there's a wide variety of stuff there, right? Yeah. Re read closely because, you know, I'm telling you the real deal here. Uh, when you read this, take them seriously. It's not just a bunch of shit I've written on there to make it sound good. Yeah, it's just it's the real deal. So when you get to the site, you'll notice that up on the top bar, there'll be the strains, right? That's mm -hmm. all the strains. Well, right next to that is a button called gambler section. Yeah. Now, in, in this section is where you can get basically untested ish stuff that I know because I'm familiar with, it's probably going to work out. I don't think I've ever had a bad gambler so far. And there's been a lot of them. Yeah. So, uh, so you can get really good deals on stuff before I really know what it's, what it's about, you know, whether it's a, a full hit or a miss, but there's nothing bad on there and you can get some really good stuff on there. A lot of people just exclusively hunt that zone to I get bet. stuff for a good deal before it comes in at the real price later down the road. So make sure and check that out. I bet. I mean, the thing is, a gambler section, the way you word it, is going to be totally different from like uh, a person getting their clone their first time, crossing it, not testing it, releasing it. These are clones you've worked with for a long time. So you have a pretty good idea with these. These, lines these are ones I have high confidence are going yeah. to be great. They're going yeah. to be fine. They're going to be excellent. And I have, like I said, I, have, I haven't thrown a dud into the gambler section yet. And I've thrown, I don't know, 30? Yeah, that's killer. So um, are you going to venture into feminized seeds at all? I haven't asked you that. Let me see. How do I put this? Hell no. Oh, he said hell no. <laughs> hell, hell, hell no. Because 
feminized seeds to me mm -hmm. are sexually unhealthy genetics. There you go. That's, there that's go. all it's about to me. And, and besides fem seeds are, are bad because of their sexual health to me. Yeah. As a breeder, especially, but I, I'm not a big fan of them anyway. They grow. I, it, that's probably an unfair bias because it was 15 or 20 years ago when I yeah, grew yeah, up, yeah. and they sucked pretty bad. Yeah, they do. I'm suck sure they've come a long then. ways now. <laughs> but the one thing that I really don't like, and I have never liked, are auto flowers. Oh Jesus, yeah. It's just it's you know why? Because no matter what it is, all the ones I've ever tried anyway. Remember when I told you about those? six or seven week plants yeah 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 flower six they all have the same high type yep all auto flowers i don't care if it's thai auto flower yeah. it all has that exact same high to it so i just think uh, those are a great option for somebody who needs them and just needs to grow a little weed i i could totally see it but as a breeder or a connoisseur i poo poo those yeah for sure yeah I, you know i remember neville said the same thing that he just couldn't do anything good with ruderalis everything just turned into shit. and i found this i don't want to say shit because it, it would be offensive to the people whose stuff i used but it wasn't as good as the stuff i was able to do with regular butter period lines it is always subpar yeah. right it's always just below what it should be it's like it reminds me of back about a decade ago there was a bunch of sativa that was suddenly released from sweden or something right yeah yeah it was all acapulco gold and all that stuff right i got a pack of that right away yeah and i grew it and i thought you know this stuff looks pretty legit to me mm -hmm. but it's all watered down yeah right whoever made it either was hideous at selecting lazy at selecting or just didn't care and just yeah flowered and bred whatever they grew, you know, without yeah. really ever looking at it. Because if you do it that way, your resin production will go down because you'll be selecting for the strongest, best plants. And the two don't really mix, right? Yeah, you're right. You Absolutely seldom right. have a super vigorous, wickedly beast-like plant that is also incredibly potent. Yeah, exactly. Right? Exactly. Usually they're, they're the medium more, you know, they're very vigorous, very, uh, and they're very, very potent, you know? Yep. It's now, that on energy. The other, on balance. the other end of the scale, I run across plants fairly often that are psycho potent, insane resin production, but they fuck talk about hard to grow. They have problems with everything. Just like with anything, people, cows, dogs, you have, you have offspring that just suck. Yeah. Right? For sure. They just, they have problems, you know, yeah. genetically heart defects, nutrient defects you know just the same with plants you have individuals that just never make the grade but a lot of times those ones that fuck them up are the same ones that make them have massive resin production yeah yeah massive that's sure. well it's been an absolute pleasure having you on here like i said you were one of the people i looked up when i looked up to when i got into this and i still oh, look up to and learn from you and and it's an absolute privilege and a pleasure to have you on i know people will be begging to have you back and um, again what do, do we have the name of your new book coming out and where it will be available yeah it'll be true living organics it'll be the druid guide the druid guide yeah it shows along with your basic stuff like i said teaches you how to grow in a lot more ways than the last one did it also shows very high order, high connoisseur, high artisan value methods. Yeah. Right? Ones that you probably don't want to start out trying to do. To jump but right into. Yeah. The basic, the basic lessons I show you in the book, it will come much easier. Like you said, to be a breeder isn't nearly as hard as you think it's going to be reading about it as when you actually get down and start to do it. You can actually, you're like, oh, that, but you look at it on paper, you're like, Holy shit, I'll never be able to do this. Exactly. Yeah, no, you just got to jump in and and learn and experience and screw up and keep screwing up because that's a lot of breeding is screw ups. And if you're not screwing up, then you're not really breeding. You're not really doing real selection. And then, and then a lot of people up. and then a lot of people can't handle that they screw up, that they're human. So they blame the seeds or or the, the breeder, light yeah. or or you know what they'll blame something else anything yeah anything but them right <laughs> yeah, anything we've seen these emails for years we know where, where i on the other hand when i see something fucked up i go all right what have i done yeah, yeah. that's my first, first instinct what have i done 
Yeah, it's a different mindset. It's a different mindset. Well, you, you know? learn faster that way. Take accept, take responsibility. You're going to make mistakes. Take yeah. responsibility and go, how can I not make this mistake again? Right? Exactly, exactly. That's what it's all about. These are the lessons from the wise. Uh, oh, yeah. For sure. If you want to learn faster and actually learn stuff, that's the way to go. Fuck it up. Don't be scared to fuck up. Don't be scared to fuck it up. Take responsibility. Learn how not to fuck it up next time. And don't cross the streams. And don't cross the stream. <laughs> <laughs> this is advice from the Rev. Thank you from all of us at the Breeder Syndicate. And uh, we, we look forward to seeing you again soon, my friend. I'll be happy to come on again, man. It's been super fun. Thanks a lot for having me. All right. Privilege and a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Cheers. Cheers. All right. Cheers.